Welcome all to the webinar, International School of Nuclear Law, Hot Topics, Expert Views. Before we formally start, we would like to go through some practical details. Next slide, please. If you have any technical difficulties, please send us a message using the chat feature as shown in the slide here. Next slide, please. During the session, please send us your questions via the Q&A function. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, there will be time to answer only one or two questions after each session. Please note that our panelists will not be able to answer the questions in writing. Finally, please note that the webinar is being recorded and will be made available online in the near future. Next slide, please. The International School of Nuclear Law, or ISNL, takes place every year for two weeks in a city in the south of France called Montpellier, and is hosted by the University of Montpellier. In fact, in the exact building that appears in the background of the slide. This year would have marked the 20th anniversary of this exceptional program. Due to the current pandemic, we were unfortunately compelled to cancel it, but we would still wanted to do something special to commemorate such an important anniversary. This webinar is not meant to mimic the ISNL or take the place of it, but rather to allow to some of our ISNL lecturers to address recent developments in some of the program's substantive areas. Before we begin, I'd like to do a small poll, which will be popping up on your screens. We just want to know how many alumni and lecturers we have in, with us today. So don't hesitate to submit your responses. So now let's see, let's see the results of the, of the poll. Well, looks like there's a lot of people who have not attended or lectured at ISNL yet. So this will potentially give you an opportunity to see uh, what we address there. And then yeah, we have quite a number of alumni. So welcome all, and this is a real pleasure to have you with us. So we usually have about 30 lecturers joining us every year at the ISNL. We have gathered today 15 of them, coming from the NEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, regulatory bodies, academia, non-governmental organizations, and private practice. Next slide, please. We will start our webinar with an introductory session featuring the Director General of the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, Mr. William Magwood. Then we'll have a recorded message from Mr. Philippe Auger, the president of the University of Montpellier. After Mr. Roger's message, we will hear from Mrs. Perry Lynn Johnson, legal advisor and director of the IAA Office of Legal Affairs. Mr. Patrick Rayners, former head of legal affairs at the NEA and current secretary general of the International Nuclear Law Association. And last but not least, Mr. Paul Bowden, ISNL program leader, partner at Freshfield Brookhouse and Deringer and honorary professor of law at the Nottingham Law School. As mentioned before, we will have a brief Q&A period at the end of this introductory session, so please do not hesitate to send in your questions via the Q&A feature. Next slide, please. It is now my pleasure to give the floor to the Director General of the NEA, Mr. Bill. Bill, you have the floor. Thank you very much and welcome to all of you. Um, and I wish you were all um, healthy and safe wherever you are located around the world. Um, we at the NEA, like many of you, are dealing with the COVID crisis and using mechanisms like this to communicate um, around the world. Um, it has been a very interesting time for all of us, and we have learned a lot about communicating using these remote um, platforms um, to hold webinars and other events um, to try to continue the work that we do to bring people around the world together uh, to address the issues associated with nuclear technology. And as we do this, I reflect on the fact that the NEA, which is now over 60 years old, uh, was formed at a time when it was soon after the beginning of the Cold War and the nuclear technology world had opened up and countries around the world were seeking the use of this new and exciting area of technology. Um, nuclear science and technology had the promise of not only unlimited energy back in those days, but also ways of uh, curing cancer, opening up new areas of science, 
exploring space. It was many, many areas of, of, of interest. And in those days, things, while they were still complex because of the, uh, the emerging Cold War, were also, um, in many ways, much simpler. And the frameworks of which countries operated were largely um, determined by their own domestic laws and regulations. However, it became clear as this technology began to spread that we had to look at things not just on a domestic basis, but on an international basis. And as a result, through many, many decisions and steps that were taken by countries, both working together and, and, and working through organizations like the United Nations um, and the OECD, I began to put together a framework that became the nuclear law framework that we see today. Um, this framework is one that has mirrored the growth of nuclear energy itself and has become, along with nuclear energy, um, more complex, more difficult to understand, and one that requires a great deal of study. And we at the NEA, uh, 20 years ago, uh, under the leadership of people um, like Patrick Rayners, who you're going to hear from later, um, took the initiative to start putting the idea together that perhaps it's worthwhile to train people on this framework. And so that they could see not just what the framework said, but really the philosophy about how it came about and why the decisions were made to put things together the way they are. And I don't know what people back in those days thought this, um, this school would turn into, but what it has turned into is really an institution unto itself. Um, it is a um, highly sought after um, discussion that takes place once a year normally, although this year we were not able to hold it because of the COVID crisis, but a highly interesting discussion that brings together people um, really from across the nuclear sector um, of all ages. Sometimes we have students, sometimes we have uh, senior officials from, from governments who come to the course and bring these people together to have the experience of working together to discuss these complex issues with the people who are most deep in the nuclear law um, arena, but also in areas of nuclear technology. Um, those who lecture are among the most accomplished people in the nuclear sector. Uh, they are people who have expertise both on the technical side, people who are legal experts, people with regulatory expertise. And it's a unique experience that 60 or so people a year get to participate in. Um, over the years, we've had over a thousand people go through this course. And when I run into people as I travel around our, our member countries, I often find people who have gone through this course and will remark that it was one of the best experiences that, that they've ever had and that they learned a great deal and they gained new insights and experiences. So in a way, it's more than just a training experience, although we consider it a training experience. It really is um, passing the knowledge that has been gathered over many decades about nuclear law um, to new generations and to a broader audience. And this has become more and more important as we go forward because the nuclear business continues to become more complex. We have, to, we have learned to respond to the unexpected. Uh, we respond to disasters, uh, both man-made and not man-made. We have responded to pandemics as we are now. And increasingly, as we go forward, we're going to have to respond to new technologies. Technologies that when the nuclear business first came into being um, over, you know, over 60 plus years ago, that perhaps people hadn't really thought about. Technologies such as advanced manufacturing and digital instrumentation. Um, we're going to have to be able to adapt to these new ways of thinking with artificial intelligence. Regulators and operators around the world are going to have to have a framework that accommodates these new technologies accommodates things like mobile reactors, perhaps, that are on barges, or perhaps moving around from place to place. Reactors that perhaps are operated by operators who aren't even where the reactors are located anymore. So these are very new ideas, but we have to have a framework, of both a legal framework and a regulatory framework that accommodates them, and accommodates them on an international basis. Um, if we're going to be successful in developing that, we're going to have, pe have people who understand um, what the framework is today and how it arrived. 
And that really, I think, is the most important role that the International School of Nuclear Law provides. It provides a strong uh, philosophical understanding of why we do what we do, why we have the framework that we have. Um, and that, that will enable these people as they go forward in their careers to adapt to the new changes, adapt to the new technologies, and adapt to the unexpected as we have always had to do. As we go forward, the International School of Nuclear Law uh, will uh, continue um, in, our, in our wonderful relationship with the University of Montpelier as, as we've had over these years. And we expect that even if we're not able to bring people together in person, that we will go forward. We will, if necessary, do the course uh, virtually if we have to, but certainly our strong preference is to do them uh, with people in person. Um, however we go forward, we look forward to continuing this mission, which I think we are very devoted to, to make sure that we bring the experts before students um, to share their wisdom, share their experiences, um, and to impart the philosophy that created um, this very complex and very important and very adaptable um, international nuclear law framework. Um, as we do so, um, the NEA relies very heavily on people uh, like, like Jimena Vasquez Magnon, who is the head of our Office of Legal Counsel, um, Kimberly Nick, who is uh, deputy head, the person I think that spends most of her efforts putting the course together over the last um, five or six years. And then um, people like Patricia Knorr and, uh, and Chiara Petroli who work and support uh, their activities. They've done fantastic jobs and they are to be congratulated for being able to uh, weather so many storms, including uh, a pandemic, uh, to bring this discussion to you today. So I thank them and I thank all those who came before them to put this course together. And we look forward to seeing all of you um, who have not yet taken the course, apply to the course, because we're going to be doing this next year, um, to, um, to impart this knowledge. Um, so with that, um, look forward to the other introductory comments and very much look forward to welcoming all of you um, who applied to this course and are accepted to the next edition of the ISNL. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. We now play the video message from the president of the University of Montpellier, Mr. Philippe Auger. Mesdames et messieurs, chers et chers collègues, c'est donc par une petite vidéo, donc de manière dématérialisée, que nous échangeons aujourd'hui pour traiter de l'École internationale de droit nucléaire. Un événement qui est inscrit dans le calendrier de l'Université de Montpellier, mais qui, cette année, contexte sanitaire oblige, eh bien, ne va plus se tenir. Mais nul doute que l'année prochaine, nous nous retrouverons toutes et tous en présentiel, donc à la fin du mois d'août 2021, pour une nouvelle édition. C'est donc regrettable que nous ne puissions pas être présents actuellement, mais je dois dire que cette école eh bien, doit continuer, doit continuer à exister dans les années à venir. Pourquoi D'abord parce que pour l'université, depuis maintenant près de 20 ans, c'est le lancement de l'année universitaire. Puisque dans les derniers jours du mois d'août et les premiers jours de septembre, les auditeurs sont les premiers à rejoindre nos campus. Ensuite, cela traduit une volonté d'ouverture internationale de l'université. Puisque chaque année, pas moins de 60 auditeurs eh bien, viennent donc représentant différentes nationalités, différents pays, et donc faisant connaître l'université et le site de Montpellier. Le troisième intérêt de cette manifestation, eh c'est de montrer que l'université répond à la logique d'universalité des connaissances et de la recherche. Vous le savez, l'université de Montpellier elle a une visibilité internationale sur certaines thématiques, notamment les sciences du vivant et de l'environnement. Le classement de Shanghai évoque cela chaque année, mais pas seulement. Une université, elle doit intervenir dans tous les domaines. Et donc l'école de droit nucléaire constitue une de ces pépites en termes de formation. Enfin, je dois le dire également, eh bien, cette école permet chaque année et à intervalles réguliers de revoir une série de collègues, notamment certains historiques. Je pense notamment à Patrick Reiners qui, depuis le début, donc, a accompagné cette formation. Alors, euh, bien évidemment, c'est dommage. C'est dommage parce qu'il y a une série 
d'organisations, d'institutions qui nous accompagnent chaque année. Je voudrais notamment saluer le travail, le partenariat qui est fait avec l'OCDE. Je voudrais également évoquer le travail qui est fait avec l'agence de l'OCDE pour l'énergie nucléaire et puis, Bien évidemment, cela, cette manifestation témoigne aussi donc d'un partenariat, d'un partenariat important avec l'Agence internationale de l'énergie atomique. Vous le voyez, au-delà de la présence physique, eh bien, c'est le maillage, le maillage entre les nationalités, le maillage entre les opérateurs, donc qui, se, qui est important dans cette école. Et donc, euh, je vous dis à l'année prochaine, à l'année prochaine pour une nouvelle édition, nouvelle édition puisque le calendrier est prévu et donc si on regarde la présence de cette école tout au long de ces années, eh bien quand même ce seront plus de 1000 auditeurs, 1000 auditeurs formés, 1000 auditeurs donc, qui auront pu échanger, échanger sur une thématique qui concerne certes les scientifiques, qui concerne également certes les politiques, puisqu'on sait bien que les questions nucléaires eh bien, sont au premier rang dans les politiques publiques, mais qui concerne également les citoyens. Il y a des interrogations, il y a des problèmes de sécurité, des problèmes de défense, des problèmes de protection. Et donc, c'est également un terme transversal qui a vocation à irriguer donc, le débat public. À vous toutes et à vous tous, au plaisir donc, de retrouver à l'Université de Montpellier, à août 2021, pour une nouvelle édition de l'École internationale de droit nucléaire. À très bientôt. Now I would like to ask Ms. Fairlyn Johnson to say a few words on behalf of the IAEA, who has provided support to the program since the very beginning. Harry, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Jimena, for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be joining you from our headquarters here in Vienna today. Um, and I'd like to thank NEA for the opportunity for us to contribute to this International School of Nuclear Law webinar. As Bill Magwood alluded to in his opening remarks, normally we'd be sharing a lecture hall together at the University of Montpellier, and I would have a full hour to talk to you about the role of the IAEA. Today, I'll be sharing just a few brief remarks on the significance of the International School of Nuclear Law for our organization. In addition, you'll be hearing from two of my colleagues later in the webinar, Wolfram Tonehauser, who's the section head of the Nuclear and Treaty Law section, and Christian De Francia, a legal officer in the Nonproliferation and Policymaking Organ section um, of the Office of Legal Affairs, and they'll be presenting on safety, security, and safeguards. Well, Bill actually said it already, and that is clearly the ISNL um, has already demonstrated for 20 years now the immense value of the program itself. And I would just add to that that it's not just valuable for the participants um, as facilitators of the program, Um, and what I've shared with other facilitators over the years now, 10 years for me personally um, participating, um, it's equally valuable for us as well. So the IAEA is an organization that seeks to accelerate and enlarge the contribution of atomic energy to peace, health, and prosperity throughout the world. And this is straight from our statute, and we do this in a variety of ways. One way, which is directly relevant to the ISNL, is the training of experts. When participants from across the globe congregate in Montpellier, they return home with an enhanced understanding of the international nuclear legal framework. Each time a new generation has been trained in these concepts, the NEA has advanced its mandate one step further. And our collaboration with the NEA in the ISNL allows us to fulfill part of our mandate as well, the training of experts. The IAEA has supported the ISNL since its inception two decades ago, which Jimena mentioned in, in her intro. Over the years, many legal officers from the Office of Legal Affairs have traveled to Montpellier 
to pass on their knowledge and experience, sometimes expertise that they themselves first acquired at ISNL years before. And I want you to know, seven lawyers in OLA right now, the Office of Legal Affairs of the IAEA, right now, today, seven lawyers in the office out of 21 lawyers currently were students at the ISNL. And six of the lawyers in OLA currently today have lectured at the ISNL. Our commitment is also reflected in the financial support that we offer to participants through the Technical Cooperation Program. By providing grants to approximately one quarter of the class at each session, the IAEA has enabled the participation of, of at least a couple hundred or more, based on the numbers that Bill shared, about a thousand participants over the years. In addition, as a member of the ISNL Supervisory Board, I have the honor to contribute in my official capacity to, the chart to charting the course of the program. And in this sense, the IAEA also contributes to the planning of the ISNL. Finally, I should also note that the number of ISNL graduates or lecturers that serve or have served in virtually all departments of the IAEA, not just the Office of Legal Affairs, bears witness to the standing of the program in our organization and the nuclear community as a whole. Thus, the International School of Nuclear Law has proven to constitute a valuable avenue for contributing to the achievement of the IAEA mandate. To build capacity in nuclear law is to advance the mission of our organization. I would therefore like to thank the NEA for the excellent cooperation between our organizations in furthering our common goals through the International School of Nuclear Law. I wish you the best of success for today's webinar and ISNL first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Perry. Now we will hear from the person who initiated the program in 2000, Mr. Patrick Rainers. Thank you, Jimena, and good afternoon, Paris time to all. Except for a few old hands reminiscing about the circumstances of the creation of the school in Montpellier is perhaps not of the greatest interest. On the other way, to explain why it was established in the first place and how it started operating and why it proved to be a perennial enterprise may be more relevant to you. So, why deciding 20 years ago to create a school specifically devoted to the law governing the use of nuclear energy? Well, first reason is because it simply did not exist. That particular branch of law was in fact practically ignored in universities worldwide. How come? To simplify things, since we have a little time, the main culprit is again Chernobyl. After the catastrophe in 1986, most academics in law faculties lost any interest in this, in that what they consider no longer as a promising discipline. Allow me here to note a paradox, which is that the post Chernobyl years would see, uh, for good reason, a surge of new international legal instruments, particularly on nuclear safety and liability. But this is another story. To come back to my subject, from a deficiency of the academic world, we made it an opportunity. There was still at the outset a problem. For the reason just exposed, the existing knowledge on a nuclear law was concentrated within those nuclear institutions, public or private, 
national or international, active in this field. And it is not the natural role or inclination of such bodies to invest in education, even if at that particular time, the perception of the aging problem of their personnel made them more aware of the importance for nuclear energy of the transmission of knowledge to new generation. Another factor behind the creation of the school in which takes place at about the same period is a major geopolitical event. You have guessed the implosion of the USSR and the emergence in Central Eastern Europe of new independent states, many equipped with Russian technology reactors, many of such reactors in dubious con safety conditions and without an effective control by the new national administrations. Remember, this resulted in an urgent call to Western countries for their assistance, economic, technical, but also extending to the institutional and regulatory sectors. Let's remark that good governance of safety being was a rather new concept then, and there were no proper legislature. This is the context in which the NEA, with the active collaboration of the IEA and the European Commission, was engaged, notably by the G8 Group on Nuclear Safety and Security, in organizing training services and the drafting of legislation for the aspiring regulators of the countries concerned. This lasted several years, and so doing, the NEA team developed a useful know-how in this domain. All these factors combine to suggest that there was both a need and an opportunity to initiate an education program on nuclear law dedicated to young professionals and to students as well. However, for an intergovernmental organization like the Paris Agency, taking the role of a teaching institutions still did not come as a natural thing, and it was found necessary not only to find a suitable territorial base, but also in terms of credibility to conclude a partnership with the respected university. To make a long story short, this was to be the University of Montpellier. That also, colleagues of the Vienna Agency and Brussels accepted to come support the adventure was a great help and moral comfort. Finally, what guided us in building the faculty and the teaching program? The central idea was to invite those international and national lawyers who had been instrumental in negotiating the very instrument constitutive of nuclear law, to invite them to come and provide their unique expertise, and they accepted. As a natural consequence, the school would concentrate on the various international aspects of that branch. To our surprise and delight, the Montpellier School gained immediately a solid legitimacy and good reputation, attracting students from all over the, all over the world year after year. Well, at the moment of concluding a presentation, you are expected to say something a little intelligent, catchy. I would simply say that retrospectively, the ISNL seems to have been the right idea in the right time and in the right place. Economics would say it's a case of supply stimulating demand. The magic worked and it still works. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick.
To conclude this session, I would like to invite Mr. Paul Bowden, our ISNL program leader since 2010, to make a few remarks. Paul, you have the floor. Uh, th thank you, Emmanuel, and thank you very much indeed, Patrick. Um, hello, everybody. Um, well, in my few words, I'd, I'd just like to pick up from where Patrick left us, uh, and in setting the scene for the panel sessions, which are going to follow, um, say a couple of things about the nature of ISNL. Um, and about two particular features of it, uh, which are that on the one hand, it's highly adaptive, and on the other hand, and at the same time, it's profoundly changeless. Now, 20, 20 years ago, as, as the first school in Montpellier was taking place, it was, as Patrick has just said, it was really a time of extraordinary uncertainties for the, for the nuclear industry globally. And much of that uncertainty uh, was being driven by really heightened public concerns about nuclear safety uh, in the wake of, of the Chernobyl accident in the, in the 1980s. But in this relatively dark time um, for the industry, it was Patrick's vision uh, really to create a sort of dedicated space for specialist nuclear law learning and a space in which there could be an ongoing transfer of knowledge from one generation uh, to another generation of nuclear lawyers. And so the core of that learning in those early years was very much built around that great body of international treaties in the nuclear area that have built up over the preceding 50 or so years. Uh, as to which there was at that time a real risk of the widespread understanding of that great body of law amongst the legal community being dissipated. Now, that's how it started. <clears throat> but jump forward another 10 years, and what a different world it was in 2010 um, in Montpellier in that particular year. Uh, 2010 seemed to coincide with a real change in the outlook for the, for the nuclear industry. Uh, there were all sorts of new ambitions for the development of, of new nuclear generating capacity. Uh, the buzz phrase, as many of you will remember from that time, was the, was the nuclear renaissance that was felt to be about to take place. And indeed, there, there were many private sector companies which were uh, entering into what until then had been a traditional sort of state controlled industrial sector. And nuclear development, particularly in the area of nuclear power plants, was looking, beginning to look almost like a sort of global public private finance uh, initiative. But on a slightly more, more worrying side, it was also uh, at a time uh, in the uh, the relatively early aftermath after the, the terrible events of 9-11 of, of and the threats of nuclear terrorism uh, and illicit trafficking in radioactive materials was very much front of mind. At this point, Montpellier and the programme responded, it adapted. Um, there was then a new focus within the programme on nuclear non-proliferation and, and safeguards and on the new uh, terrorism conventions which were, which were entering, as it were, the international statute book. And there was also within the program a much greater exploring of the practical connections uh, between the international treaty regime and private law subjects like international trade and commercial contracting. So today, as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of ISNL and and enter into what's now its third decade, um, what are we going to be looking at? Um, how is the program going to adapt further? Well, um, we'll be hearing about that from some of our panelists who are going to follow us with their hot topics and their, uh, and, and their fresh ideas. But I suspect what will be in the minds of at least some of them are a couple of issues. Uh, one of which is, well, there has been a nuclear renaissance of sorts, uh, but it's not been in the places that it was necessarily expected to have happened in. And it's been in some places where it's been necessary uh, for the nuclear community and in particular the nuclear legal community to help create new national nuclear legal infrastructures and at speed. Um, we're also at a point where 
it might be said we're on the threshold of major uh, technology shifts, which, uh, which DG Magwood talked a little bit about at the beginning. Um, and these are vital to keep nuclear, as it were, in the game in the international nuclear energy markets. But um, to do that, there are going to have to be new laws on the planning and the permitting of new, these new types of technology, which simply don't exist at the moment. Uh, these are issues that undoubtedly we're going to be saying and talking a lot more about uh, on the Montpellier programme. And there's going to have to be new thinking as well in relation to fiscal law, uh, antitrust and uh, trade laws, both at an international uh, and national level, if nuclear is going to be able to make the long haul contribution to meeting the challenge of climate change that faces us all. So ISNL's process of continuing adaptation, well, well, it's, it's still continuing. But I said one other thing in, in the beginning of, of this introduction, which was, it's also a program which is profoundly changeless. And this second thought isn't so much about <clears throat> what ISNL does, but about how it does it. Now, as Patrick has said, what has been quite unique right from the start about ISNL is Patrick's ability to assemble a group of the world's leading experts to be its teaching faculty. And ISNL, Montpellier, is in truth really a structured assembly of masterclasses. That's what it's been for the past 20 years. And that's what we try to make sure it is today and, and that it will stay so in the future. So we're all very sorry that, that this year for uh, events and circumstances of the human condition, we're, we're, we're not able to take you uh, to Montpellier, but over the next hundred minutes or so, um, we are able to bring you some of the distinguished members of the ISNL faculty to join us all in debate and conversation, and hopefully to bring as well something of the flavor of the specialness of ISNL. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you to all of you for this introductory panel. The, the history of the ISNL is quite unique, and there is a real Montpellier spirit, and, and there is a real family of the ISNL, as those of you who attended the course know. It's always a pleasure launching a new session with the participants and the lecturer who all make the program so great. But now that we have introduced you to this program, I would like to turn the floor back to Paul to begin our substantive sessions. Paul, program leader, it's your thank turn. Well. Uh, thank, thank you, Imene. So as we always say, Montpellier, after the intros, let's get started. And we are going to start with a session on fundamental nuclear safety conventions. And the three distinguished faculty members we've got with us to take us through this are Lisa Thiel, Senior General Counsel of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, uh, Stephen Burns, former Commissioner and indeed Chair of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, and Wolfram Tonhauser, section head of the Nuclear and Treaty Law section of the Office of Legal Affairs of the International Atomic Energy Agency. So I think, Lisa, you're going to start. Thank you, Paul, and good morning to all from where I sit in Ottawa, Canada, where it's morning. So the Convention on Nuclear Safety is the fundamental nuclear safety convention. Quick refresher on the nature of the convention. It's been enforced since 1996, so it's a little bit older than the ISNL, uh, but at the time of its development, the incentive nature of the instrument was brand new, a reflection of global interest to have binding international nuclear safety obligations based on an existing consensus uh, on IAEA fundamental uh, requirements, but as applied to different technologies in different countries and subjecting national regulatory systems to international jurisdiction. So what's an incentive convention? The CNS sets out obligations on contracting parties respecting what's required for nuclear safety in terms of fundamentals. And the control mechanism is peer review. 
So every three years, contracting parties submit reports on how they comply with the requirements and then participate in a review meeting to discuss each other's reports, ask questions, and learn from each other. That is, the structure of the CNS is one of cooperation, sharing information, and continuous improvement. So it's really more about how contracting parties are complying than whether they are, identifying practices to emulate, as well as challenges to address. Enlightened self-interest is the incentive. So contracting parties' participation allows them to learn from each other, to challenge each other, and to thereby uh, improve nuclear safety worldwide. Next slide, please. So how does the CNS respond to today's needs? Through today's lens, uh, I'd suggest the peer review process has been shown to be amenable to evolution and continuous improvement something that regulators demand of the industry, but which isn't always evident or feasible in the context of static international treaties. So why do I say this? First, I think it's the combination on one hand of treaty obligations that are fundamental principles and peer review with the flexibility on the structure reporting and conduct of the peer review process itself on the other. So it ends up in the mechanics and process that contracting parties have addressed, have addressed improvements to the effectiveness and transparency of the peer review. It's not through amending the CNS itself that this has been done, but through consensus built templates, definitions, standardized comparators, and clear guidance on reports and attendance to help the peer review process. The structure allows for innovation uh, by consensus. Steve's gonna talk about the Vienna Declaration, which is a good example of this. Uh, I just note transparency. So whereas, whereas the convention itself speaks to confidentiality, there's been an evolution to making national reports public by default, inviting journalists to plenary sessions at review meetings, etc. This is done by consensus of the contracting parties in recognition of the value of transparency to the peer review process. I note also that the CNS obligations are fundamental principles. This can serve the interest of global safety as circumstances and facts change since they're fundamentals. So for example, the pandemic. Meetings of the convention where governments, regulators, and industries share experiences and their challenges in ensuring the fundamentals are achieved, provide a ready-made forum for, for such things like pandemic-related learning and lessons from each other, how the fundamentals can be achieved in that context. So in conclusion, I think the CNS can indeed be responsive to today's needs and to the never diminishing need to share knowledge and challenges with our peers in the interest of nuclear safety. I end on that note, Paul, with my thanks. And thank you very much indeed, Lisa. Um, set up beautifully, Steve. I think, I think you want to follow, yeah? Yes, good morning, everyone uh, from Washington, DC, where Lisa and I are in the same time zone, uh, I believe. It's great to, to be with you. Um, as she said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Vienna Declaration. Um, we're about 10 years out now from the Fukushima Daiichi accident and about five years, uh, or a little over five years since the Vienna Declaration was adopted. So the initial response to the accident was seen primarily in both national and in the case of the EU regional efforts to uh, address the, uh, the impact of the accident, to assure facility safety, to improve the capability to respond to uh, severe accidents and things like that. But what about at the international sphere? There actually were a number of proposals to amend the conventions. Russia, for example, uh, offered an amendment to the early notification uh, convention. And Russia, Spain, and Switzerland offered amendments to the Convention on Nuclear Safety. None of those uh, proceeded uh, significantly. Uh, but finally, in late December 2013, the Swiss offered uh, a, an amendment uh, to the CNS, which was taken up at the sixth review meeting uh, that was held the following spring of 2014. Can we have the slide, please? And what 
what you're going to see there at the top is the text of the, the significant text of the Swiss Amendment to the, uh, to the convention. Um, and what I would ask you to focus on is here is how it focuses not only on new construction or new plants, but also to the improvement of, of safety uh, objectives for ex the existing fleet of plants. And that was the controversy over the Swiss proposal. Uh, the, w at one level, we can, we can say that it really is meant to lift all the boats in terms of the overall safety of facilities, but the questions raised uh, concern to what extent and what was the necessity of uh, trying to achieve the same type of um, uh, safety parameters for new construction as, exi as existing. Um, there, so, so you had that kind of a, a potential objection. Uh, some would say, it says, what was the purpose of the, um, uh, of the amendment since the, the basic principles could be said to be in the existing CNS, particularly uh, in, Article 18, in Article 18. Um, there are some important uh, players in the nuclear field, particularly Russia and the United States, uh, were not in favor of this, uh, of the, uh, the Swiss amendment. Uh, but at the conclusion of the sixth review meeting, it was referred to a diplomatic conference, which was held at the beginning of 2015. However, in the run-up to, uh, in terms of preparation for that uh, co conference, um, it was decided that the amendment would not uh, likely uh, pass, uh, and there was a decision made to create, in effect, the, what has is known now as the Vienna Declaration on Nuclear Safety. And the idea was that this would not, was not a binding instrument, uh, but basically a, a, an admonition or a statement of principles uh, with respect to uh, nuclear safety. And you see the important text there. And notice how in the first paragraph, we talks about basically new construction, new design. And the second paragraph has a language with respect to safety assessments of existing, uh, of the existing fleet. But it's a very, it's much more subtle, I would say, uh, and, and in some ways, the, uh, the statement with respect to the existing fleet uh, does not go as potentially as far as the Swiss proposal it does. And again, that was adopted in February 2015. So where does that all leave us? I do think what it shows is that we are very unlikely to have new instruments that are in the safety area. Uh, as Lisa has mentioned, much of the system re re uh, depends on the peer review uh, system and the, uh, the consensus, uh, consensus building of the an incentive approach under the, under the CNS. And I think that's what's going to continue on. It does, however, outline in the importance of collaboration and experience sharing in the application and development of safety approaches and responses uh, to uh, plant events. And I think we'll continue to see that. To my mind, the next innovations are not primarily through new international instruments, but in cooperation on harmonizing regulatory assessment and acceptance, uh, particularly in the case of new technologies, such as SMRs and advanced reactors. Uh, and we are starting to see some evidence of that. And I think our next panel may even touch on that. So thank you very much. Steve, thank you very much indeed. Um, and so to complete the initial presentations in this panel session, could I call on Wolfram, who I think is going to talk about the safety issue from the point of view of the other great safety convention, uh, the Joint Convention. Wolfram. Uh, I'm trying to, good afternoon, uh, and uh, from IE headquarters in Vienna, and I'm trying to join also uh, this uh, uh, round table this afternoon to talk to you about the joint convention. I'm trying to start the video, but it doesn't work. So I may just uh, continue without uh, the video or the IT technician will fix this, I would think. Shall I wait or shall we just continue? Why did, why did you continue, Wolfram? You, you've got such a wonderful radio voice. 
Very good then. Well, let me talk to you and just to say a few words about the joint convention. Um, we've heard about the convention on nuclear safety, which is the first legally binding instrument, as we've heard, to address the safety of uh, civil nuclear power plants. And uh, the joint convention is the first legally binding international instrument looking at the safety of spent fuel management and on the safety of radioactive waste management, or uh, to use the words of the IAEA Director General, um, just at this organizational meeting in the connection with the joint convention that we are having this week, the joint convention is a central piece in the nuclear safety architecture. Both the joint convention and the convention on nuclear safety represent, as we know, a commitment to achieve and maintain a high level of safety in these areas and is all the more important, therefore, than to see them in action. Now, before I look at the evolution of the Joint Convention over the past 20 years, I would like to just briefly recall what the Joint Convention covers and what it does not cover. And I would also like to mention some of the key points in respect of the Joint Convention. In a nutshell, the Joint Convention applies to spent fuel and radioactive waste when it results from the operation of civilian nuclear reactors. It uh, applies to uranium mining and milling waste and to discharges from regulated activities. The Joint Convention does not apply to spent fuel held at reprocessing facilities as part of a reprocessing activity. It does not apply to radioactive material containing only natural occurring radioactive materials, known material, which is outside the nuclear fuel cycle. And also, it does not apply uh, to spent fuel and radioactive waste from military and defense programs. Like the CNS, and in fact, also like the uh, revised nuclear liability regime, about which we will hear later uh, this afternoon, the Joint Convention is a post Chernobyl international legal instrument, meaning it was drafted and adopted in the aftermath of the Chernobyl accident. Uh, Lisa Thiele mentioned the incentive character that was also served as a model for the Joint Convention. Uh, like in the CNS, it has, the Joint Convention therefore also has a peer review process as a central element whereby contracting parties submit national reports, ask questions, provide answers, and so on and so forth. Always a key point that I, I'm making in this context is that this peer review uh, mechanism is quite effective and the key word in this context is there is peer pressure as a result of peer review. The Joint Convention is drafted despite its title as a single instrument because it covers both spent fuel and radioactive waste in a dual structure. Uh, the reason for this is because there was a conceptual uh, difference in views about uh, uh, those countries that reprocess uh, because for them, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, in the Joint Convention, radioactive waste is defined as all radioactive material for which no further use is foreseen. And for those countries that do reprocessing uh, spent fuel, was there was a further use foreseen. And therefore, this dual and uh, this conceptual difference and the joint character of the Joint Convention. Uh, there are currently, just to you know, give you some statistics, there are currently 83 contracting parties out of 172 member states. Uh, and that's uh, fairly, well, there could be improvement in the numbers, I think, despite, you know, because the, the Joint Convention is indeed relevant for both nuclear power and non-nuclear power countries, in fact, for all states. Uh, some countries still think that the Joint Convention is not relevant for them, uh, notably if they only have disuse sources on their territory, in fact, but it's not true. Uh, contracting parties also do recognize there is still a need for uh, fuller or, or, or a more intense participation of contracting parties in the peer review process, timely submission of national reports, submission of questions and answers on time, active participation in the review meetings, but at the same time, I would like to mention that contracting parties also recognize that the preparation of the national reports may be a burden to smaller countries. Now, let me say a few words about the evolution of the peer review process during the past 20 years. Just like in the Convention on Nuclear Safety context, what is important to notice is that at the beginning of the joint convention, there was uncertainty how the different review meetings should evolve. Should the review meetings be static, meaning that there would be a repetition of the same issues every time a review meeting takes place, 
or should there be an evolution of the discussion, meaning that one review meeting builds on top of the other? Now, the argument for following a more static approach were in fact that contracting parties felt that those, if there are new contracting parties joining, how could they uh, join an already a process that has already advanced? But in the end, uh, the evolutionary process uh, and approach succeeded. And as a result, now it's important to note that one review meeting builds on top of the other. The issues at the time of the negotiation of the joint convention in the 1990s were in particular the spent fuel management and the dual structure of the convention, import and export of radioactive waste, uh, you know, which led to the Article 27 on transboundary movement of radioactive waste, multinational radioactive waste uh, management facilities, where we have a provision in the preamble, and also the return of disused steel sources to the country of origin uh, was one of the issues or the contentious issues at the time of the negotiation of the convention. Uh, the topics since the first review meetings were starting from very basic discussions on the content of the various provisions and also on the scope of application uh, and the first review meeting in 2003 to more in-depth review of the specific technical aspects of radioactive waste management, certain topics such as stakeholder involvement, international cooperation, different radioactive waste management strategies and funding uh, mechanisms that was at the meetings leading up to 2012. Uh, in 2015, there was obviously a dedicated session on progress and lessons learned from the Fukushima accident. Uh, and then there were at the uh, last review meeting in 2018, dedicated topical sessions on recent developments and challenges in the safe management of disused seal sources and general safety issues, public acceptance aspects except associated with the storage and disposal of high level radioactive waste and so on and so forth. I did briefly mention uh, that we are having actually this week, uh, the organizational meeting taking place under the joint convention. So we have a new president for the upcoming seventh review meeting, which is scheduled for May, 2021. It is Mr. Hans Wanner from Switzerland. And his vision for the, and looking ahead, and his vision for, uh, for the seventh review meeting is that there should be a particular focus on overarching issues as they are of concern to all contracting parties, on remediation of legacy sites, and also on openness and transparency uh, uh, under the joint convention project, uh, uh, convention. Um, there will be uh, now a dedicated topical session uh, at the next review meeting on stakeholder involvement during decommissioning activities and with regard to legacy waste, including large volume of naturally occurring uh, radioactive material. Uh, I'm almost closing just to sum up. I think uh, looking back at the evolution of the joint convention uh, over the past 20 years, it's fair to say that and it was mentioned a little, you know, already by Lisa, uh, the convention, like the Convention on Nuclear Safety, moved from confidentiality to transparency. If you look at Article 36 of the Joint Convention on, on, on Confidentiality, you see this is a, well, a, a rather elaborated article on confidentiality. In the meantime, contracting parties make available their national reports publicly. Um, also, I, I, I think it's fair to say that radioactive waste management was considered at the time of the negotiation of the Joint Convention as a matter of essentially national concern. In the meantime, it's of concern to all. And also, it moved from a reluctance to peer review to an established process and also, and that's the last point, from being the only instrument addressing spent fuel and radioactive waste to being part of a broader nuclear safety framework. And with these brief remarks, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Wolfram. So could I, could I gather our other panelists uh, together with you uh, for us to uh, take a couple of, well, I, there was, we had a question that we were actually gonna sort of put around the panel generally for their views, but there's, there's a really cracking question that's actually come in from, uh, from, from, from you in the audience. And uh, I think we should have our discussion around this one actually. Uh, and, and the question is, is this, uh, um, Article 11.2 of the Convention on Nuclear Safety 
requires that appropriate steps are taken to ensure that sufficient numbers of qualified and trained staff are available for all safety related activity in each nuclear installation. And um, this person's obviously got their convention out, has also put in Article 12, Human Factors, also requires the contracted parties to take appropriate steps to ensure that the capabilities and limitations of human performance are taken into account throughout the life of a nuclear installation. The question for our panel is, what are governments doing to meet these objectives in the face of COVID-19? Lisa, do you want to start with that? Sure, and thanks, Paul, because I, I love that question. Because yeah. as you say, this is, a great, this is a great way to demonstrate that the CNS process is actually responsive to change. And like, these are fundamentals. Qualified staff, how to have as many, uh, sufficient and qualified. Uh, so I, I, I would say this is something that CNS will review. Um, I know that Canada has suggested that the eighth review meeting uh, can, can address and should address pandemic responses uh, in, in country presentations. Uh, so I, I will say that from the Canadian perspective, um, minimum shift complement is, is what we call the sufficient and, and qualified staff. So licensees have uh, canceled leave, restricted access, done, um, made everything to ensure that essential workers uh, are there and non-essential workers are not there. They've staggered shift turnover and been able to maintain uh, their minimum shift complement. Uh, and, and also uh, there has been uh, regulatory action uh, with respect to the qualified staff because the qualifications tend, uh, are, are time limited and require renewal. And, and there has been decision making by the regulator in Canada to temporarily uh, extend the qualification period because of the pandemic related need for uh, social distancing that, that affects some of the requalification processes. And, and, so, and so you like you, you meet the fundamental safety principle in the context of the current need. And, and I think uh, the CNS process uh, is a way to for uh, contracting parties to share the information, to share the challenges they've met, and to learn from each other. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, Wolfram, could I just ask if you've got anything to add, as it were, from an international perspective on that? Um, what I wanted to say is, in this context, I think there was an interesting uh, letter from the chairman of the International Nuclear Safety yeah. Uh, group uh, INSAC uh, that was by Richard Meserve and that is also uh, available and because it, you know it's a tradition that the chairman of INSAC uh, submits uh, a, a, an open letter to the director general of the IAEA so this one was uh, part of the general conference deliberations and it's available on the general conference website to the public and this was uh, 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 and it's, a, it's an annual letter that he writes on his perspective on current emerging safety issues, and this this year, of course, was that uh, on the on the uh, on the uh, uh, addressing the COVID uh, pandemic. What is interesting, and I just give two points out of this letter. What is what was interesting is that uh, you know he focused in particular for uh, on the, on the aspect of additional human resources, saying that given the possibility that a pandemic could decimate the staff in positions important to safety. Uh, uh, utilities and regulators should prepare now by increasing the numbers of certified staff. And there is another aspect in the letter, and it's certainly worthwhile reading, I'm, but I'm not going to into much further detail. Uh, but there was an interesting aspect in my, uh, in my view, and that was that uh, elimination of face-to-face -face meetings may adversely affect safety culture. Because you don't have face-to-face -face meetings, and you know, and, and working remotely may actually inhibit safety culture because the exchange of uh, uh, the exchange of views and the interaction is different, and that I found a very interesting aspect. Uh, 
so that's just what I wanted to add. But certainly uh, for for reading uh, it, uh, the, the, the 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 letter that was. Um, pass on to the general council would be worthwhile. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Walter. That's really helpful. I, I mean, I, I, was, I was going to leave it there, but uh, we've got another question has just come in and it's specifically directed to you, Steve, and I think it'd be great to get your response to this. Um, it's uh, really interested to hear what Mr. Burns had to say about CNS and the Vienna Declaration being at the end of the road for any new legal instruments. Um, but in a world where we're into lifetime extensions, for installed nuclear generating capacity, leave aside collaboration between regulators, is the current legal regime really up to the job of delivering safety in an era of aging technologies and nuclear power plant makeovers? What do you think, Steve? I, I think the answer is yes. I mean, this goes back to, I think, the tension since the very beginning over the CNS itself. Um, if you go back and look at some of the, the literature, there are people who are just horrified that uh, of this weak incentive peer and not even peer review convention that uh, it really, that it did nothing. But I think as Lisa said, I think our experience, I think has shown that it does become the good the 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 ready platform uh, for further you know for further evaluation for raising standards and ultimately in the you know in the international regime national uh, national regulators and operators within uh, within countries that's where the primary responsibility for safety is um, and the international regime I think can can help with that um, uh, but. I think the framework allows us to do to to achieve those kinds of uh, t kinds of goals. Um, what I, I guess I would just say I don't I don't see that it's so much a a limitation um, of of the international framework. I think it's as Lisa I think really uh, well put it um, that it it opens it up it it it. It, it allows for um, sort of innovation, and it allows for us to address, you know, the uh, you know emerging challenges. Thank you very much indeed, Steve, and thank you all of you, Lisa Wolfram. Uh, that was a terrific session. Um, time forces us on to our next session, uh, which is on licensing and permitting of nuclear. Uh, activities. Uh, the panel here is going to be Director General Magwood, uh, joined by Kimberly, uh, and I've managed to get into this session as I think a bit of a stowaway. Um, so I think, Bill, we're going to we're going to start with you on this, if we can. Well, for, first, it's a pleasure to um, to come back to speak with you again. Um, I very much enjoyed the last panel session. Um, all three. Had, excellent insights that gives you a good flavor for what the discussion is like at the International School for Nuclear Law. And uh, particularly good to see uh, Steve Burns, my former colleague from the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, and and is, 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 since he's, he's, uh, he's ahead of me in terms of retirement plans, so I'm watching what he does very closely to, to get good advice as to how to go forward. Um, we're going to talk a bit about licensing and permitting for nuclear activities. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, the world is changing. There's a lot of new technologies on the forefront, a lot of new issues, and we're going to discuss that a little bit. And I'm going to invite um, my other panelists to uh, join me on camera, Kimberly Nick, uh, who is a deputy head of the Office of Legal Counsel with the Nuclear, with the nuclear Energy Agency, um, is going to speak with us about environmental impact analyses and long-term operation. And Paul Bowden, um, who is not here as an afterthought, but he's here because of his great expertise, as you know, is the, um, the, uh, the, the, the program head of the ISNL and has been so for since 2010. Um, we're going to, um, and I think Kimberly, you're first, so um, please, why don't you take the floor? Thank you very much, Bill. I really appreciate it. And it is my absolute pleasure to be here with you today to discuss um, uh, environmental impact assessments and long term operation. So, um, the, as many of you know, the first large scale civilian nuclear power reactor began operation in 1957. Although that reactor has long since been shut down, we actually have reactors that were built just 12 years later that are still operating. 
with a number of reactors that are over 50 years old now, and about 70% of the world's reactors over 30 years old. Countries around the world are assessing whether, and if so, how, to allow reactor operation to continue. Now, a number of different issues are analyzed as part of the LTO review process. The technical issues have been largely settled, especially when it comes to the 40-year operating time. But the question about whether an environmental impact assessment should be part of the LTO review process remains an open issue. Now, it's widely agreed as it stands now that the construction and operation of new reactors requires an EIA, but this was actually not always the case. Most reactors operating in NEA member countries were built before the ESPU convention entered into force, and their construction was often not subject to an EIA process. And this is one of the reasons why the EIA question is actually such a hot topic. Now, in some countries, like the United States, there is a clear requirement for an environmental review as part of the license renewal process. However, in most countries, a license extension does not systematically necessitate an EIA. There are several explanations for this, many having to do with the form of the LTO authorization, where licenses are open-ended, no changes are made to the license, or no major works are foreseen to continue operation. There's not necessarily a trigger to perform such an environmental review under the existing laws. The EIA question remains subject to substantial legal uncertainty and is the focus of intense discussions among the parties to the ESPU Convention. There are currently 15 open information gathering cases with the Implementation Committee of the ESPU Convention, six of which relate to license extensions. With the expectation of more LTO cases in the future, the ESPU parties decided in 2017 to establish an ad hoc working group to start drafting specific guidance on this issue. In this, they're addressing three main questions. Does the lifetime extension represent an activity or a major change to an activity? Is the lifetime extension likely to cause significant adverse transboundary impact? And finally, is the lifetime extension subject to a decision of a competent authority in accordance with the applicable national procedure? The draft guidance has been prepared, but it has not yet been agreed to by the ad hoc group. There are considerable disagreements remaining among the members of the group. And in fact, no element of the guidance has yet been agreed to by the whole group. And even within that, there are additional areas of quote, particular disagreement. One of the main issues is whether the guidance should be applicable to an activity itself, the lifetime extension, or whether it applies to decisions. Whether a country employs a specific time limited authorization term or an indefinite duration authorization often determines whether there is a specific regulatory decision on LTO, which then leads to a specific LTO authorization. If the guidance is in fact limited to LTO decisions or authorizations, most parties to the convention would not have to undertake an EIA process. So slide please. Now, if you're interested, you can find more detailed information on LTO licensing processes in the 2019 NEA report on the legal frameworks for long-term operation of nuclear power reactors, which you can see on your screen. We're also putting the link to this report into the chat if you'd like to download it. Now, interestingly, the LTO decision question raised another more global issue for SBU member countries which is whether there's actually an obligation under Article 2 of the Convention to establish a national decision-making procedure for, quote, any activity or any major change to an activity that is likely to cause significant adverse transboundary impact. The scope of this reaches far beyond LTO and could possibly affect any proposed activity, not just a nuclear energy-related activity. And it raises the broader question that for any covered activity, should we assess or reassess the impact of such already authorized activity over time? Additional questions remain to be answered, such as whether a lifetime extension per se can be classified as a major change, and whether and when multiple minor changes can amount to a major change. And these are actually some of my favorite questions because they raise a philosophical puzzle called the ship of Theseus. This puzzle posits that if a ship at sea has had all of its old planks replaced with new planks, one at a time, 
until every piece of the ship is new. When the ship arrives at port, is it the same ship or is it a new ship? Now we can actually ask the same question of a reactor. Reactors undergo both minor and major component replacements over the course of its life. By the time of an LTO authorization, regardless of how gradual the changes were, is a reactor the same reactor or is it a new reactor? Now, all of these issues are still being hotly debated. There remains hope that a decision can be reached on the guidance by the end of the year. But as you can see, there's still significant work to be done. And while I don't have time to discuss it now, the ad hoc group actually isn't the only place that this issue has been addressed. There was a decision last year by the Court of Justice of the European Union that a 2015 Belgian law extending the operating life of the Dole 1 and 2 reactors was adopted without the required environmental assessments being carried out first. This case has particular relevance at an EU level because it interprets both the ESBU Convention and the EIA Directive, among other instruments. So thank you very much for your brief time. And at this point, I will now turn the, back of the floor back over to my friend Paul to wrap up the session. Thank you very much indeed, Kimberly. Um, well, I, I am grateful for being allowed onto this panel session because it gives me an opportunity to plug my, my favorite hot topic at the moment, which is the direct legal role that civil society, and civil society is the public, it's everyone, it's you and me, uh, the role we're being increasingly invited to play in the development of nuclear infrastructure. We normally think about licensing and permitting in the context of, of regulatory activity. And of course, that's by far the largest part of what uh, regulation and permitting of nuclear facilities involves. But it's not the whole of it, or at least it's not the whole of it everywhere. Because since I would say around the, 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 the 19, mid 1990s, right across political systems and across cultures, there's been a sort of quiet, pragmatic understanding that's been growing that new nuclear infrastructure actually requires what you might call a social license as well. Now, in 2013, uh, a, the UK Parliamentary Committee on Energy and Climate Change uh, produced uh, a report in which it sort of summed up what I'm talking about. And just to quote briefly from this report, um, the committee said, the perception of the potential hazards associated with nuclear power play an important role in public attitudes. But so too does the level of control people feel they have over these particular hazards and the extent to which relevant decision makers and regulators are trusted. Now, these thoughts, these dynamics play into this concept of the social license. Um, and that concept has, since the 1990s, started to take a really concrete form in a body of international conventions and, and a treaty under the auspices uh, of, principally under the auspices of the United Nations Economic Council for Europe. Now, one of those conventions is the ESPU Convention, which, which Kimberly was speaking about uh, just a minute ago. But another of these UNEC conventions, which I want to highlight, is the Aarhus Convention of 1998. That was when it was adopted, and it came into force in, in um, 2001. Now, the full title of the Aarhus Convention is uh, a convention on access to information, public participation, and access to justice in environmental matters. And the convention does exactly what it says on the tin. It requires the states who are parties to the convention to make provisions in their own national laws and regulations for the public in their respective countries to have legal, specific legal rights. And these legal rights are to be given and the right to call for a very wide range of environmental information from governmental and public authorities, including regulators, 
including regulators in relation to their licensing decisions, on things that may affect the environment around the individual seeking that information. And the convention specifically provides for information relating to uh, radiological effects in the environment. Uh, the second right that's granted is the right actually to take part in the decisions being made by public authorities. And the Aarhus Convention makes explicit and specific mention and a requirement for the licensing of pretty well most types of nuclear facility to be the types of decision making to which the public uh, must be given a right to participate. And the third right is that where the public authorities don't comply with the first of these two obligations, then the public, the citizen, can take the authority to the national courts or to uh, uh, some other type of independent tribunal and to have legal remedies imposed for these failings. Now, Aarhus currently has 47 partners, uh, parties rather, they're, they're mostly in countries in Western and Eastern Europe and in Central Asia. But the convention is open to all, to all countries. Um, the convention unquestionably over the last 10 years has had a transformative effect on the environmental laws and on civil justice in a number of the countries uh, which have uh, signed up to the convention, and not least, it must be said, in the, in, in the European Union. And the convention has now been, since 2010, has now been invoked in well over half a dozen cases involving major nuclear power projects. And so for me, the three pillars of Aarhus, which, which I, I've, I've just mentioned, I've just outlined, are one of the hottest topics for future development over, over the next decade. And, and why do I say this? Well, first of all, it's, it's the notion of a social license for nuclear development. I don't think is any longer just linked to the access to environmental justice agenda or the sort of thinking around the need to engage for civil society that was going through the mind of the UK Parliamentary Committee back in, back in 2013. Um, it's now all connected. The need for the involvement of the public, of civil society, is now all connected to even wider movements to deliver on the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, through which concern for the environment and concern for people's fundamental rights and freedoms run like great golden threads. And it's this particular understanding, and this is my second reason, is explicitly stated in another treaty. And this is the Escasu Agreement of 2018. Uh, it's an international agreement between uh, Latin American and Caribbean states. It's not yet in force, uh, but it will be. Uh, and when it is, it will effectively translate the Aarhus principles into this very important regional context, and unquestionably, other global regions will be following. Bill, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, and look forward to the conversation about um, your comments and Kimberly's. And so let, let me, and I'll, I'll be the one to sort of back cleanup here to use a baseball term <laughs> and 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 highlight a couple of things and and as the first non-lawyer um, to provide um, a lecture in this context um, i'm going to instead of focusing on um, the specifically legal aspects focus on uh, some of the things that we're dealing with now um, as the sector progresses and as i think many people know uh, we're in a very interesting period in the nuclear energy um, field. We have um, many new technologies that are being advanced um, towards the regulatory process. Um, by last count, there are nearly 70 different um, innovators who are working on designs that they hope to bring to market over the next decade or so. And many of these um, are very unique technologies or technologies we've never um, deployed commercially before, including generation four technologies, 
uh, very small mo module reactors, uh, micro reactors, many different types of, of systems. And they present some special challenges for us, which I think the legal system is going to have to adapt and incorporate. Um, so I wanted to highlight a couple of these issues, which I think are very important. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, particularly Paul's thoughts about how the social license for these technologies might work because their relationship with society will be very different for reasons I'll explain. Um, first, and I think the most um, prevalent case that we have talked about in recent years are these small module reactors. And when we say small module reactor, that can mean any number of dozens of different type, type of specific technologies. But in general, we're talking about reactor systems that are small enough to be manufactured in factory um, and then deployed um, in location, much like you might see an aircraft being built at an aircraft factory and then flown to an airport. It, it is a very different approach. And these um, small technologies um, have the characteristic that not only are they manufactured, but they also typically have very, very high um, safety performance and um, require, for example, in, in theory, uh, no offsite emergency preparedness, which is a completely different um, discussion from what we normally have with nuclear power uh, technologies. Um, as a result, many of the vendors who are developing these technologies feel that these uh, systems can be deployed um, very close to the demand center. Uh, for example, some of the smaller systems, these micro reactors, could be deployed um, in small communities in remote areas. Uh, for example, in the northern parts of places like Alaska or in small communities in um, different other parts of, 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 the, of, the, of the world. And what we see is that these technologies could be built and placed where, for example, small fossil fuel facilities had been in operation, not providing um, uh, gigawatts, but providing perhaps 10 megawatts or 20 megawatts of, of electric uh, power to these small communities. Um, and also, not just communities, but also small, but also large manufacturing activities like you know, aluminum smelters or mines. And there's a lot of discussion, particularly with our Canadian colleagues, about the possibility of locating these small reactors near mines. Um, this changes the, the, the configuration we usually, we usually have with nuclear power. With nuclear power, we're used to having a large central station that is quite some distance away from population centers, and then the, the electricity is, is transmitted um, over, over transmission lines. Um, now we're talking about having a much closer uh, geographic relationship. And this is a very different uh, picture. Um, now, it's a combination of both the fact that these technologies have these very unique and high safety uh, characteristics that enable them to be placed close um, to where people will be working and, and living, and also the fact that they are small enough to be directed to provide supply for specific purposes. So this is more of a case of distributed generation. Uh, we're used to thinking of distributed generation in terms of uh, fuel cells or um, diesel power generators, but in this case, we would be talking about nuclear power plants. So that's one issue that's very interesting about this. Um, in addition, um, another issue that these technologies deal with is the fact that because they are small, uh, that they, and typically, and I'm sure that some of the vendors would, would take issue with this, but typically the analysis shows that if they're going to be successful economically, they have to be built in relatively large numbers. So instead of building one or two reactors like we've done with many designs in the past, you might have to build you know, uh, scores of these reactors in order to have the economic model uh, be successful, which means they have to have a very broad market. And that suggests that they look a lot more like, as I mentioned earlier, um, aircraft than they do nuclear power plants. Uh, they're not being built as unique facilities in a country um, but being built as a product, it'll be exported around the world. Um, in that case, then the question arises, how do you license that? And if you license it the way we traditionally license these technologies, that means you have to go through a multi-year process in each country um, as the technology is introduced to that country. And if you've ever been through a licensing process, you know this is very difficult, very expensive, 
The regulator will ask unique questions and you can very well have a situation where in order to deploy a technology, you go to country A and spend five years and several hundred million euros to get it licensed. And then once you get that done, you go to country two and spend another five years and several hundred more million euros to get licensed there. And as you can see with these small systems, this is really almost a barrier to moving forward. So these, so, so how to license these technologies, how to harmonize and standardize the licensing process so that if you deploy a technology in Canada, in France, and in Korea, that you have the same approach and don't have a, a unique licensing process every time. Is that, how do you do that? How is that possible? That is a big point of discussion in the community right now. Um, there are different answers to the question, but it's one that we're dealing with uh, at this moment. Um, the final thing, which I think is very interesting about these new technologies is something I mentioned in my opening comments, which is some of them are mobile. Um, as I think has been very well publicized, um, Russia has deployed um, a, a floating nuclear power plant. This is a plant that was built in one location um, and then floated to a operating location where it will be essentially adhered to a, um, a docking facility, a special docking facility, and operate for some number of years. And then after the time comes for it to be refurbished, it'll be unbolted and floated back to a place where it'll be, uh, where it'll undergo some refurbishment. Um, this is not the typical nuclear power plant. This is a whole new way of thinking about a nuclear re reactor. Um, one that will be floating um, on the ocean um, as not as a, as a as necessary powering a ship, but really as a power source. And the, the, the legal and regulatory framework around that is something that needs to be analyzed. We don't really have a lot of clarity on some aspects of this. So there are three areas where the legal and regulatory framework is going to have to catch up to the technology because these technologies are on the drawing board, going into licensing now, and in some cases, as I said, in the case of Russia, already deployed, in a, at least on, on, a, on a first of a kind basis. And we are hearing a great deal of interest about all these technologies from around the world. And um, on top of all of this, with all these different technologies, we also have the prospect of how do these technologies get deployed in countries without these very large, sophisticated um, licensing frameworks as you would see in countries like France or um, the United States or Canada or UK. Um, but if you have a country that, that has not used nuclear power before, it does not have hundreds of people available that understand how to license these technologies, what is the way that we as a global community look towards deploying those technologies? What is necessary? Um, can we adopt something that looks a little bit like the aircraft industry analogy where you can build an aircraft in, in, in France and, and, and fly it to Japan and then sell it to, uh, to people around the world. How, how do we do that? So that's the big question we're dealing with. It's a huge one. Um, I don't think that the answer is going to come across very easily, but it is front and center, one of the most important issues that we're dealing with in the nuclear sector today. Um, so now, uh, now if Kimberly and Paul can join me, I think we'll start the, the discussion. And I'll, I'll, I'll start by leapfrogging off of this conversation about these small reactors, and I'll turn to Kimberly, um, who talked about the ESPO. And Kimberly, so you, you've heard me sort of uh, pontificate about these new technologies. How do you think that these new technologies will be treated in the context of ESPO? Do you think that the, um, the framework is, is flexible enough to accommodate these new technologies, or do you think we're going to have to rewrite them in order to accommodate SMRs and other new technologies. Thank you, Bill. That's that's a really great question, and you know it, this really hits at the the heart of the fact that a lot of these conventions, even if you look at the the CNS, were really written from a perspective of our traditional large nuclear power plants. If you look at, I'll just start and mention the CNS briefly, where it has a definition of nuclear installation, which talks about a land-based civilian nuclear power plant, and so there's perhaps an adaptation that's going to have to occur if you want to try to advance and look at how these conventions are, are going to address these new technologies. Now, looking specifically at the, the ESPU convention, 
Um, and SMR can be classified within the, um, the Appendix 1 definitions. It says it's a nuclear power station or nuclear reactor. So there's not necessarily a reason that we can't look at SMRs within that context. But within the SBU context, for it to apply, it's actually a two-fold test. So not only does it have to be listed in the Appendix 1 list of activities, but it also has to look at, say, whether it's likely to cause a significant adverse transboundary impact. And that's really the key question here when we're looking at advanced reactors and SMRs. The design of SMRs is typically mentioned as such that they're not supposed to meet that definition. You're not supposed to have a significant adverse transboundary impact. And if ESPU really is about looking at the impacts on your neighbors, if there's not supposed to be any kind of impact across boundaries, then the ESPU convention isn't likely to apply in the same way that it does to our large reactors. There's a number of safety systems in place with SMRs where you're not going to have that impact. But I will just briefly say that just because you may not need to do um, an EIA under an SBU context, you may still have to do an environmental review of some sort from a domestic standpoint. So there are those two different questions of whether you're doing a transboundary environmental impact assessment or you're doing a domestic. And so it's not necessarily the case that you're not going to do any sort of environmental there's likely still to be national legislation in place such that there is a required environmental review. It may not just may not be the same as you would do under ESPU. Well, let me, let me follow up with that, uh, Kimberly, because it raises an interesting question for me, which is who decides whether a technology is capable of having a transboundary um, effect? If you have a country that wants to deploy an SMR and their regulator has said, We've analyzed this. We don't think there's any possibility of an offsite uh, emergency uh, release of radiologic material. So therefore there is no transboundary effect. But then the country that is say um, 30 kilometers away fr from this plant says, well, we don't agree. Uh, we think that any nuclear reactor could have a transboundary effect. Um, and therefore, um, you know, we think you have to go through ESCO. So who decides? Who makes, who, who's, who rules in that case? Who makes the decision? So the SBU Convention has a definition of transboundary impact in Article 1. And there's also in, um, in the appendix, there is a larger um, explanation of what could be considered as having um, a significance in the significance determination project to determine whether something is going to have that kind of impact. But countries can come together and have that conversation and make a determination amongst themselves. And if there's not an agreement, there is a procedure with the ESPU convention to, um, to raise those disagreements so that there, there is the ability to make that challenge. Okay, so there, there is, a, there is a, 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 a negotiation process. There's a mechanism there, in yeah. place, yes. There's a mechanism to do that. Um, yes. Paul, very similarly for the ARBUS <laughs> convention, um, as you heard me talk about these, these new technologies and you have these technologies like micro reactors, which could be in your backyard, essentially. Yes. Um, doesn't that change the whole picture of how Aarhus would work? If you have, tech, if you have the possibility of, of not just a few facilities in remote areas, but potentially dozens, if not hundreds of small reactors in different locations, um, powering mines or factories or anything else. Well, how, how do you see this evolving? Yeah, I would two. I mean, two points if I could briefly brief on that, Bill. I mean, another another great question. Um, it, it, there's a particular part of Aarhus, which is Article Seven, uh, which provides that uh, in relation to rights to information and rights to public participation, uh, those rights extend to the stage in the development of a technology where it's at the point of plans and projects for the introduction into a country or into a market of a particular new type of new type of technology. And, and so um, my guess would be that in the pretty embryonic state of affairs at the moment with regard uh, to uh, the licensing and permitting regimes anywhere for small modular reactors, um, and particularly uh, bearing in mind that as I understand it, um, the rollout of small modular reactors isn't going to be uh, really worthwhile unless it's done on a very clear fleet basis. Um, in any country where 
<clears throat> SMRs become a way forward as part of the of the provision of nuclear generated energy, uh, there will be national governmental level decisions as to whether or not uh, this sort of technology ought to be introduced. And that's where I see Aarhus playing its main part, actually, whether or not an SMR in a particular country or introducing SMRs into a particular country is going to have an environmental effect of, 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 of a sort that requires further or more detailed consideration. And I would also say that there's a one of the other UNEC um, well, not quite a convention, uh, but, but part of the, uh, the convention package that Kimberly and I have been talking about is the so-called Kiev Protocol. And that's, again, all about plans and projects uh, and requires uh, strategic environmental assessments for where there is a plan to introduce a new technology. So I can see alongside Aarhus, uh, the Kiev Protocol processes uh, coming, coming into play as well. Um, uh, the other side to this, of course, is that um, when we get to the point of individual licensing decisions um, for multiple SMRs, at multiple uh, sites in, in, in a particular country, then there is potentially an awful lot of information that an awful lot of people are going to be requesting on a constant basis under Aarhus. And there's been an interesting question, I think, that, that's, been, that's been coming in during the course of our discussion, which has sort of said, and, and with some justification, but isn't Aarhus and Espoo, for that matter, really a, 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 sort, of, a sort of protester's charter? Uh, it, it, isn't it something that it effectively will hold up uh, nuclear development rather than facilitate it? We'll see. And certainly the SMR example I've given may well be a very interesting acid test of, of how these conventions and Aarhus particular operate. I would just end on hopefully the optimistic note that the principles and the philosophy underlying Aarhus and Espoo and Kiev are such that even though they may create pain and complexity for us all, not just the regulators, in progressing with nuclear development, once we're through that process, and we're moving forward with the technologies, we'll all feel an awful lot more comfortable that we've done it that way. I appreciate that very much, Paul. And I, I think if you look at what we have learned through our different engagements with stakeholder involvement, um, workshops and other discussions that we've been having within our framework, that the basic conclusion that we keep coming to over and over again is that no matter how long these discussions take and no, how, no matter how much energy goes into these engagements with the public and with other stakeholders, at the end, it will have been worth it because you will have a much stronger final decision than if you had not gone through it in the first place. Um, so let me thank both Paul and Kimberly for, for their uh, sage comments. Um, I would, I, we've, we've got probably a dozen questions here, but I think Kimberly would be very upset with me if I if I if we skipped the, the next sessions and kept talking. So with that, I think uh, Laura Walk, Walk, Rockwood is going to take over the next um, session, session three, and um, I will bid all of you um, uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the the, um, the engagement. Thank you very much. Well. Um, I'd like to just march right ahead because we have some very, very interesting speakers with us today. And we are going to start off with Sonia uh, Drobiz, who's a senior legal officer at Vertic. Then we'll have Christian de Francia, a legal officer in the nonproliferation policy making section at the IAEA, whom I had the pleasure of hiring. And then a few words from myself. So let's start with Sonia. And why don't you share with us some of your thoughts on uh, ensuring nuclear security during a global pandemic. Sonia. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, and good afternoon, good morning, good everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to be joining you today, and I'd like to thank uh, DNA for the kind invitation uh, to participate in this webinar. So the hot topic I will address now is that of nuclear security which I'll remind is the prevention of, detection of, and response to criminal or intentional unauthorized acts involving or directed at nuclear material, other radioactive material, associated facilities, or associated activities. Interestingly, a number of side events were held on the margins of the IEA General Conference last week to address the specific issue I would like to address today, as Laura said, 
ensuring nuclear security during a global pandemic. So the IEA also published uh, reports and surveys on the impact of the pandemic on the operation, safety and security of nuclear and radiation facilities, which mentioned physical uh, protection and security. And we've briefly discussed the issue during uh, the session on nuclear safety as well. But this issue has not necessarily been approached from a legal perspective, and this is what I would like to do now. So first, and because according to international instruments, nuclear security should be based on the current evaluation of the threat, I would like to remind that according to the IAEA Incident and Trafficking Database, which reportedly remains fully functional, acts including illicit trafficking, thefts or losses of nuclear material have continued to occur over the past year. The pandemic does not necessarily put the nuclear security threat on hold, and opportunities for vulnerabilities have been identified, including, for example, the ongoing threat of nuclear terrorism and the risks of cyber attacks, which remote working and the increased use of technology may actually have increased. So nuclear security threats remain a matter of concern and nuclear security must continue to be a priority. At the international level, this means continuing to strengthen the universalization and implementation of the framework for nuclear security, including the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material as amended, the International Convention for the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism, but also non-legally binding guidance and codes. Raising awareness on this framework can be done through remote platforms, and this webinar is a good example. The IEA has also launched the so-called New Sec Talks, Nuclear Security Through Law Online Events. So this is an example of how to continue working on nuclear security. Legislative assistance to review and strengthen national legal frameworks for nuclear security can also include remote activities. At the national level, nuclear security measures may need to be adapted during the pandemic. And here it is worth reminding some of the fundamental principles in the CPPNM as amended. According to the CPPNM, each state party is responsible for establishing and maintaining a legislative and regulatory framework to govern the physical protection, including licensing and inspection system. A competent authority should be responsible for the implementation of that framework. During the pandemic, some authorities have reported a risk of reduced oversight, expressing concerns that physical protection may not be ensured due to facilities locked down or a limited number of security personnel. Others have adapted their practices to implement mitigation measures to maintain an adequate level of regulatory oversight, including, for example, remote oversight activities and inspection. Parallel to a risk of reduced oversight is what could be considered regulatory relief or flexibility. According to the CPPNM as amended, each state should ensure that the prime responsibility for the implementation of physical protection of nuclear material facility rests with the licensee. The responsibility is not shifting during a pandemic and licensees should make all reasonable effort to meet regulatory requirements. However, the regulators have recognized that complying with some nuclear security related requirements may be challenging and perhaps even detrimental sometimes to nuclear security. Thus, for example, the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission is enabling an expedited exemption review process for certain training and requalification requirements for personnel performing security program duties. Such exemptions and processes should actually facilitate licensee efforts to maintain security personnel staffing levels and effectively implement physical protection programs necessary to protect the facilities. In exercising reduced oversight, seeking and granting regulatory relief, authorities and licensees have been aiming to maintain the security of all regulated activities and maintain the capacity to respond to a nuclear security event. Finally, the pandemic is showing that it is crucial to be prepared through legal frameworks and emergency management business continuity plans. Those frameworks and plan should enable the quick identification and adaptation of priority nuclear security measures in the context of the pandemic. And sustaining a strong nuclear security culture 
uh, parallel to, for example, a nuclear saf safety culture, which is what Wolfram mentioned earlier, uh, is also crucial. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again, albeit remotely. And uh, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Christian, who's going to shift from security to safeguards. Security, as you may be aware, has to do with uh, detection, diversion, the de detection deterrence of the misuse of nuclear and other radioactive materials by a non-state actor. Christian is going to focus on safeguards, which is more about detection and uh, deterrence of diversion of nuclear material by states. So Christian, take it away. We'd love to hear about how the agency managed safeguards compliance during a global pandemic. Thank you, Laura. Are you able to hear me? We are. Excellent. It's great to be here with you and with Sonia in the virtual ISNL. Uh, I am gonna talk about safeguards compliance during a global pandemic. And some of the data that I will be referring to is contained in uh, reports that as Sonia mentioned, there were, were reports published uh, by the IAEA discussing the impact of the pandemic on, uh, well, safeguards, but also other matters, including nuclear security and our operations. And those can be found at the general conference website, the archives of the IAEA general conference conference for 2020. So safeguards are a relatively action-oriented uh, arena for the IAEA because we have about 300 safeguards inspectors that are conducting nuclear verification and that is the verification of the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Uh, they are normally traveling all the time, uh, so we had to adapt our activities during the pandemic, but the legal framework does not change. Even though our actions may change during a pandemic, the legal framework does not change and we must continue to meet our legal obligations. So. Uh, just to remind everyone on what are those obligations, so safeguards are implemented on the basis of safeguards agreements, and the agency implements safeguards agreements in 183 states. In 175 of those states, we implement safeguards on the basis of comprehensive safeguards agreements with parties to non-nuclear weapon state parties to the NPT. And in five states, we implement safeguards on the basis of voluntary offer agreements, and that is with uh, nuclear weapon state parties to the NPT. And finally, there are three states that are not party to the NPT, India, Pakistan, and Israel. And in those states, we implement what are referred to as item-specific safeguards agreements, which apply to very specific nuclear material or very specific facilities. So in those 183 states, we have safeguards obligations, and all of those states have safeguards obligations to the IAEA. So when we think about the impact of the pandemic, it's most useful to go back to March because in early March, we faced the most extreme form of the lockdown. It came very fast, very sudden, and we went from, uh, as I said, an agency where, you know, inspectors are traveling uh, constantly, 300 or so inspectors are traveling constantly, to a situation where we faced major travel restrictions, major access restrictions. So, First and foremost, the agency uh, took into consideration the health, safety, and well-being of its staff. So we were sent home, we were working remotely, but safeguards inspectors are essential workers. So this work had to carry on. And in order to do so, we, the agency uh, instituted these uh, business continuity arrangements. So this is something that has been planned for a long time. I think nobody expected that we would have to actually rely on them, uh, but it required a lot of ingenuity, a lot of perseverance. And if you can think about it where, you know, flights are canceled and the inspectors are supposed to get to countries to, uh, to inspect uh, nuclear facilities, we uh, had a lot of trouble to do that. And 
the inspectors had to endure quite a lot. So first of all, we had to cooperate with states and remind them that uh, there are these safeguards obligations that continue to apply even in a crisis, even in a pandemic. And, uh, and, and to, to get them to cooperate, to allow safeguards inspectors to continue to conduct their activities. So inspectors had to endure sometimes two week quarantines uh, before, so they would go into a country and have to wait two weeks before they could do their activities. They had to sometimes do long road trips, you know, just thinking about how are we gonna, how are they gonna get to the country? Uh, a lot of uh, bureaucracy to make sure we are complying with health and safety requirements of the countries that, uh, that the inspectors are going to. And, and so sometimes they wouldn't even know when they're gonna come back. And of course, uh, one thing that the agency did, which it had never done before, is to charter flights. And that was um, particularly useful uh, in the context of continuing the agency's verification and monitoring activities under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is, uh, it includes measures that are, uh, are implemented in Iran based on Security Council Resolution 2231 and the JCPOA. So that work continued. Now, we also uh, had to prioritize, you know, what is the most important? What are the most uh, time uh, critical activities that need to take place to centralize scheduling, to do PCR testing. So when inspectors would leave, there would be a test. They would have a test when they come back uh, to procure PPE. And all of this required these, you know, the support of member states, but also extra, extra budgetary contributions from member states so that we could have enough money to actually implement these activities. So those mitigation measures were very important. And from a legal perspective, mitigation is the key phrase. So when there's some kind of a force majeure or something that is, uh, is, is impeding the fulfillment of, uh, of legal obligations, then it's really important that the parties take steps to mitigate the situation. So what did we do during this time? From the beginning of March, until the end of July, the agency conducted 787 inspections, 237 design information verifications, and 44 complementary accesses under the additional protocol or additional protocols to safeguards agreements. And as I mentioned, we continued to do our verification and monitoring activities in Iran. So this is just a reminder that nuclear verification is an essential activity. Nuclear inspectors, or IAEA safeguards inspectors, are essential workers. And nuclear verification, the peaceful verification, or the, excuse me, the, the verification of the peaceful uses of nuclear energy must continue. The legal framework does not change during a pandemic. So this is kind of a, I think it's an incredible story in a way of what the agency has done during this time to continue to meet its obligations. And uh, with that, I think I'll uh, end my remarks and be happy to take some questions. Great, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, it's always been impressive to me the way the agency has managed to do its safeguards activities and to be able to fulfill those obligations so professionally during this pandemic is nothing short of extraordinary. So with that, um, I have the pleasure to speak to you today about some of the hot topics in the nuclear non-proliferation regime. And I am going to focus on three particular issues that I think are important for you as participants to be aware of. But let me start out with thanking the organizers. And as lovely as Vienna is, um, I, I wish that we were all together in Montpellier. So I think there are three hot button safeguards issues, safeguards related issues that we should touch on. The first is the NPT review conference. The second is Iran and the JCPOA. And the third is North Korea or the DPRK. Let's start with the NPT review conference. Every five years, the parties convene a review conference, what we call the RevCon. This year was to have been the 50th anniversary of the NPT's entry into force, the cornerstone of the nuclear non-proliferation regime. It was supposed to start in April, April 27th to be exact, but three things happened one after the other uh, and we are where we are. First of all, uh, due to the untimely death of the previous Director General Amano, the president designate of the NPT Review Conference, Rafael Grossi, had to step down because he was appointed 
the successor to BG Amano. The second thing was the appointment of Gustavo Slavinen, another Argentine diplomat who became the president designate of the NPT review conference. And in fairly short order, it became clear that the April 27th date was a non-starter. Currently, the NPT review conference has been rescheduled for January this next year. Um, there was some discussion about whether it should be in New York or Vienna. Um, currently, it's, it's fixed for New York, but one has to stay tuned because of the pandemic and see whether that would actually be shifted as well. In anticipation of the NPT review conference, though, there are a couple of issues that hopefully between April and next January, we will have had more time to think them through because there was a lot of speculation about whether this review conference was going to be successful. Key issues, the lack of progress and disarmament. In fact, the two most recent um, arms control agreements have either been terminated or are standing on the precipice of being terminated. The first is the 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces or INF Treaty, in which the US and Russia agreed to actually eliminate uh, nuclear and conventional ground launched, launched ballistic and cruise missiles within certain ranges. It was the first time these superpowers had agreed to a reduction of their nuclear arsenals. They eliminated an entire category of nuclear weapons and they permitted on-site inspections. For a variety of reasons, the United States on August 2nd, 2019, formally withdrew from the INF Treaty. The second treaty, which is still in force, at least until the 5th of February, 2021 is the uh, 2010 New Start. It was another agreement between the US and Russia, and it limits the number of deployed strategic nuclear warheads. The treaty is due to expire in February next year, unless the parties agree to an extension for up to five years. If you've been following the news, you've been hearing the US position that this should now become a trilateral initiative with Russia, China, and the US but China has resisted these overtures. So you have the lack of progress in disarmament. You have the very deep divide concerning the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. You have the nuclear weapon states and the umbrella states, the states that are under the protection of the nuclear weapon states, nuclear weapons. And you have the very committed um, countries that hope to see nuclear weapons banned in their entirety. This is a very new treaty. It was only uh, adopted and open for signature in 2017, and it requires 50 states to have ratified the treaty. Um, actually, it's at 46 right now, so uh, the TPNW could indeed enter into force in very short order, but that certainly won't help with the rigid positions that have been taken on both sides of that issue. Within the NPT, the other really big ticket issue is the Middle East WMD free zone. In 1995, as part of the uh, extension of the NPT, there was a decision taken about the establishment of an effectively verifiable Middle East zone free of WMD, uh, nuclear, chemical, biological, and delivery systems. Nothing much was done on that until 2010 where the parties agreed to five practical steps to make progress towards the implementation of that resolution. The regional conference that was supposed to have taken place in 2012 did not happen. Following the failure of the 2015 NPT Review Conference, um, we had the decision by the United Nations First Committee to convene a conference in 2019 and every year thereafter until the zone is achieved. So it took it out of the context of the NPT and into the context of the UN uh, uh, General Assembly. They did convene a conference in 2019. They do have one scheduled for this November. It remains to be seen where and how that conference will take place. They may try an in-person format with limited representation, but it all depends on the pandemic. And the final NPT issue has always been, as it is every year, will there be an agreed outcome document? And if so, what would it look like? 
dot, 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 remain tuned to this. There's no answer to that question yet. So the second area I wanted to touch on is Iran and the JCPOA. As most of you will have known, um, in uh, um, actually a Bastille Day in 2015, Iran and the uh, EU and the E3 plus three agreed on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Basically, in exchange for constraints on Iran's enrichment and reprocessing pro, uh, um, programs, uh, the sanctions that had been imposed by the Security Council, the EU and the United States uh, were lifted. This had begun implementation in January 2016, but unfortunately, at least in my view, just a little over two years later in May 2018, the United States declared itself to be a non-participant in the JCPOA. Now, um, we don't know what will happen with the JCPOA. The Iranians have remained party to the JCPOA. Uh, the US believes the snapback provisions uh, require the reintroduction of sanctions. The other parties, the parties to the JCPOA do not hold that same view. Major impact will likely be the US election on November 3rd, but you also need to keep in mind that there's an Iranian election of their head of state in June of next year. And finally, I think another incredibly important hot topic under non-proliferation and safeguards is North Korea. In 2017, the US and North Korea came as close to war as they probably have in decades. Uh, culminating with President Trump's fire and fury speech in the UN General Assembly. Interestingly enough, in less than two years, uh, we've gone from President Trump referring to Kim Jong-un as little rocket man to becoming BFFs, as I said, in less than two years. What will happen with North Korea? What will happen with Iran? And ultimately, what might happen in the um, NPT Review Conference will be deeply impacted by the US elections, which are scheduled for the 3rd of November. Um, I think everything is on the table, as governments tend to say. And uh, as I said, stay tuned. So that's my presentation. We now have the opportunity for me to pose a couple of questions to Sonia and Christian and then hopefully have time to take some questions from our other participants. The first question I had was for Sonia. What do you think we can expect on an international level in terms of nuclear security related events or activities? In particular, maybe you could share your take on the meeting of the state's parties to the amended CPPNM and could you recommend any resources for our participants who want to dig into nuclear security more deeply? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, for those questions. Uh, well, on the first point, um, we can start with mentioning that some important uh, nuclear security related events happened uh, before the pandemic. So the IAEA International Convention on Nuclear Security, the so-called ICONS, which are now organized every four years, uh, took place in Vienna in February. And as we mentioned with Christian earlier, uh, the IEA General Conference also took place last week and a substantive nuclear security resolution was adopted, uh, which encourages states to become party to the amended CPPNM and ICSENT, the International Convention for the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism. And it also calls upon states to establish competent authorities and encourages the IEA Secretariat to assist developing their nuclear security framework. So those activities will continue uh, in the coming months. And mm -hmm. On your specific point about the CPPNM, uh, for those who are not aware, Article 16 of the amended CPPNM requires the IAEA, the treaty's depository, to convene a review conference five years after the amendment um, entries into force. And the amendment entered into force in 2016. So the conference is set to take place in 2021. Preparations for the conference are continuing. Uh, some technical meetings happened prior to the pandemic, uh, but also a draft agenda and program for the conference uh, were prepared. 
The agency has had to postpone uh, some promotional events as well as the preparatory committee uh, meeting itself. But the agency is also taking steps to ensure uh, that this does not impact the preparations for the conference. It is, of course, uh, very difficult to say what uh, the month uh, ahead will look like, uh, but preparations for the conference are ongoing and nuclear security is still on the agenda at the international level. Now, on the second point, uh, I realized that, of course, uh, I didn't have uh, the opportunity to develop a lot of the international legal framework for nuclear security uh, just within five minutes. But there are a number of resources that interested participants can, uh, can look at, starting with the IEA nuclear security, but also Office of Legal Affairs uh, web pages. Uh, there are substantive publication on the international legal framework for nuclear security, uh, also information on the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, and of course, the IAEA nuclear security theories. I'd also encourage the participants to have a look at the NEA publications on nuclear security, especially in the nuclear law bulletin, mm -hmm. where they will find very, very good and very interesting uh, articles on nuclear security. Then on the International Convention on the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism, uh, participants and interested uh, people can have a look at the UNODC and UN uh, counter, uh, Center for Counterterrorism Center resources, focus on, on terrorism and nuclear terrorism. And VERTIC, the organization I work for, uh, has also developed pages on the national implementation of certain international security instruments with related assistance tools and publications. So that's, um, that's what I wanted to mention at this point. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, I might revert to you about the subject of NGO participation in this conference. I don't know if you have any insider information on that, but I'm gonna to turn to Christian and give you a chance to think about that. Has the agency's experience with this COVID pandemic had an impact on how the IAEA will conduct safeguards in the future? And if so, in what ways? What, what is the agency, uh, has it impacted it? Have we changed the way we do inspections or the way we send inspectors around the world? Yeah, thank you. That's a, a very good question. As I mentioned in my presentation, so we've had a lot of experience already with, you know, how to adapt in this kind of situation. So there won't be any change in the legal framework. The question is, how do we meet those legal obligations? So a lot of what we'll be seeing is more remote meetings. So this is common. I think um, this is something we're experiencing now, uh, doing remote trainings, having remote meetings, and this will, we don't know how long this is going to last, but this will continue sometime into the future. Now, in terms of actually conducting infield verification activities, this is a key issue because uh, inspectors need to verify with their own devices, with their own eyes and ears. This is, this is the concept of verification is that they actually can go into states. So what is key is, and what has already been done, is that um, as part of our business continuity arrangements, we're working with states in their business continuity arrangements to ensure that the inspectors have the necessary permissions that they need to get into the countries. Now, of course, as you've heard throughout um, this whole workshop, you know, there's, there are adaptations taking place in the area of nuclear safety, nuclear security. So in terms of operations of plants, so that there are differences for the countries and we have to go in parallel with them to some extent uh, and take into account those changes in operational activities. So to the extent that we're looking into the future, this is in the process of being formalized. It's in the process of being, well, let's hope it's not, this isn't just the way life is, you know, for forever, uh, but we have to, you know, kind of create new routines and we have sort of a rhythm for that. Um, as I mentioned now in, in uh, March, we had the most extreme form of the lockdowns and now we're getting bits and pieces here and there. So in some areas we're able to do more and there were activities. So I said, you know, we did a lot of stuff, uh, 
um, during this time. But there were activities that we weren't able to do. And in particular, uh, if you think about short notice inspections, unannounced inspections, complimentary access with 24 hours notice, that becomes a lot harder in this environment. So how is that going to impact the agency's ability to draw conclusions and so forth? That is all something that, you know, it's going to depend on how are we able to uh, work in the future? Are we able to, to resume those activities and to compensate for them in certain ways? So the planning for the future becomes key. It, I can't give you a, a completely definitive answer, but I think that paints the picture of what we're facing and how it is that we're adapting and, and kind of instituting these business community arrange, arrangement, business continuity arrangements that, uh, you know, we're always on the shelf and now here we are actually using them. So crisis management becomes a, a, a key factor in terms of how do you mitigate, how do you continue to meet those legal obligations. And I must say, from a personal point of view, kudos to the inspectors who are still traveling and doing that. Uh, Sonia, Incredible. Any, thoughts, yeah. <laughs> any thoughts on the, the participation of NGO in uh, the CPP and M amend, amended CPP and M convention? Well, I certainly, um, I, of, I'm of the view that uh, NGOs should participate. Uh, this is, uh, they, they can provide, you know, expert input to the discussion uh, on physical protection, nuclear security system. Uh, also assistance programs uh, and a number of, you know, NGOs and civil society um, do work on, on those issues and can really provide uh, significant inputs and discussions um, to, to the conference. Uh, and there is precedent to do that. Uh, NGOs participate in other uh, treaties review conferences, such as the, uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conferences, uh, the, but also in other fields, for example, the Biological Weapons Convention mm -hmm. uh, review conferences. So there is precedent for that. Uh, so I, I'm certainly uh, all for it. Uh, now, I don't have more insiders information about the process, uh, but I certainly hope that this is something that will be uh, possible uh, for the conference if it happens next year, hopefully. Couldn't agree with you more. With that, I think we're at the close of our session, and I think it's my... Uh, Honored to turn our uh, proceedings back over to Paul. Paul, go ahead. Hey, well, away. Laura, thank you so much. Absolutely fantastic session. Uh, it, it's such a pity that we've got so little time for all this. Huge thanks to you uh, and obviously to, to Sonia and Christian as well. So, um, as ever, we save, <clears throat> we save the best till last. And our last session is liability, insurance, uh, and trade issues connected with that. Um, for this session, uh, we're going to start with uh, the five-minute presentation from Imena. Uh, she's going to be then followed by uh, Mark Tetley, who is uh, an insurance consultant, a specialist in nuclear law matters, and uh, former managing director of Price, Forbes and Partners. Uh, and with him is William Fork, a partner in the international law firm Pillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw, Pittman. So, Imena. Thank you, Paul. So I um, have to introduce nuclear liability to you all. So the, as you know, the production and use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes involve hazards of a special character and potential far-reaching consequences. Please, can you put the slides? Despite the high level of safety achieved, the possibility remains that incidents capable of causing considerable and transboundary damage can occur. In addition, damage caused by ionizing radiation may not manifest itself until many years after the incident which caused it. Also, given the complexity of the technology and the fact that hundreds of persons are involved in the construction or operation for nuclear installation in the event of a nuclear incident, several different persons could be responsible for causing the damage and victims would in all likelihood have great difficulty in establishing which of those persons was in fact legally liable for that damage. Finally, given the important amounts of compensation that could be at stake, it is important to make sure that there is enough money to adequately compensate the victims. Many states have therefore concluded that general tort law is not well suited to deal with the particular risks involved in nuclear energy and have set for a special regime for nuclear third party liability. The primary objectives of this special regime are threefold. One is to ensure adequate compensation for damage caused to persons, property and environment to make sure that operators who are in the best position to ensure the safety of their nuclear installations 
and their transport activities assume full responsibility for any breach of that safety while not being exposed to any excessive liability burden. And finally, ensure that those associated with the construction, operation, and the commissioning of nuclear installations, such as builders and suppliers, are exempt from nuclear liability. The special regime should also, as far as possible, provide a uniform system for all countries that could be affected by a nuclear incident occurring in a neighboring country. Next slide, please. The first International Nuclear Liability Convention was adopted under the auspices of the OECD in 1960 and is referred to as the Paris Convention. Some states consider that the amounts made available by the operator under such convention may not be sufficient to compensate the potential victims and decided to adopt another convention in 1963, the Brussels Supplementary Convention, which provides for additional public funds that are provided either by the state where the nuclear accident occurred and then by all the parties to the Brussels Convention, which would contribute to an international fund. Only Paris Convention countries can ratify it. In fact, only 13 contracting parties to the Paris Convention are parties to the Brussels. The 1963 Vienna Convention was adopted under the auspices of the IAEA. This convention is very similar to the Paris one and does not provide for additional public funds as in the Brussels Convention. After the Chernobyl accident occurred, the Paris and Vienna Conventions were amended in order to draw the lessons learned from that accident and improve the nuclear liability regime. In 1997, the protocol amending the Vienna Convention was adopted and in 2004, the protocol to amend the Paris and Brussels Conventions. A new convention was also adopted in 1997 under the auspices of the IAEA, the Convention on Supplementary Compensation for Nuclear Damage, which is better known as the CSC. Why this convention, which principles are very similar to the Paris and Vienna ones? There are several reasons for that, but given the time constraint, I will only give one. This IAEA convention establishes, in fact, a regime which is similar to the Paris-Brussels regime. It provides for the internationally adopted nuclear third-party liability principles and for additional public funds. So, in fact, instead of having two separate conventions, you have everything in one. All states parties to the CSC will have to contribute to the international fund. All these conventions contain the internationally accepted nuclear liability principles, which are the strict and exclusive liability of the operator, which means that only the operator will be held liable in case of a nuclear accident. The victims will not need to prove fault or negligence, but only the cause of link. The conventions provide for a minimum amount of liability of the operator, allowing the states to define whatever higher amounts they want. Some have even opted for unlimited liability, like Germany, Japan, and Switzerland. In order to ensure that there is money available immediately, the conventions provide for an obligation of the nuclear operator to obtain and maintain insurance or other financial security. Of course, if the operator has unlimited liability, the national law will provide for the amount up to which he has to maintain his financial security. And also, finally, as for all legal actions, they also provide for a prescription period. These principles apply whether the nuclear accident causes or not transboundary damage. But there are other principles that apply exclusively in case of transboundary damage between the states that are parties to the same convention. The most important one I would say is that the conventions determine which are the competent courts and the applicable laws. Next slide, please. Having explained what is nuclear liability and the international nuclear liability regimes in a glance, and really in a glance, as it is a little bit more complicated than what I just explained, and I'm sure that those familiar with this subject uh, will agree with me here today, I would like to let you know the big news that has the nuclear liability community quite excited about. I mentioned that after the Chernobyl accident, the Paris, Brussels, and Vienna Conventions had been amended. The 1997 protocol to amend the Vienna Convention entered into force in 2003. But the 2004 protocols to amend the Paris and Brussels Conventions have not yet entered into force. Unfortunately, I will not, have, not be able to get into the details of why it has taken so long. But what I can tell you is that there were some impediments that were lifted and now the contracting parties to the Paris Convention have started preparing for the ratification that should take place, hopefully, We'll see at the latest by the end of next year. So why is this ratification important? 
It's because the revised Paris and Brussels supplementary conventions was the last international nuclear instrument not to have been updated. And more specifically also, it put in place a more protective regime. You can see in the slide the major improvements that will be enforced. I will not get into the details of that, but so we will keep you posted on the discussions relating to this ratification that will certainly give us another op opportunity to do maybe a webinar. And if we cannot do an event in person, something I think we're all looking forward to very much. Thank you, Paul. That will be my introduction to nuclear liability and the latest news in this field. Thank you very much indeed, Jimena. And so I think um, it's Mark next. Hi, uh, Paul, uh, and thank you, Jimena. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I will start uh, with just looking at the uh, history of the insurance world and recognizing that any commercial activity that needs to uh, progress and develop will inevitably need private insurance. That is pretty much a fact of life. So the nuclear sector was really no different. And there's been a parallel development of an insurance market and uh, nuclear liability insurance arrangements alongside the legal, <coughs> alongside the legal uh, developments that uh, Jimenez just outlined. And the first thing and the most important thing that really happened was the insurers recognized that uh, the catastrophic accident that we we call a catastrophic accident in the insurance world is um was a sort of something that would be a cross-border ev event uh, maybe a multi-year latent latency uh, doubt about who's liable and, and very high amounts of uh, uh money involved and that demanded um some kind of mechanism to help the insurers cover these uh, nuclear risks commercially so one of the key principles of the conventions is the strict liability and the radioactive contamination exclusion clause that the insurers introduced at the outset uh, is the embodiment of the channeling the strict liability uh, responsibility of the operator and the uh, th this this clause um, you will find in the notorious small print that we are all well known for in the insurance world on pretty much any policy and that is the mechanism by which uh, the operators are made liable for uh, nuclear damage and you as, an in, uh, as somebody who's insuring your car and all that, your normal insurer is not. So how is this insured? The, in, the, uh, initially, the market set up uh, nuclear pools, which were sort of market-wide. All the uh, insurance companies participated and they formed a special uh, insurance arrangement to ensure that the risk was uh, covered um, specifically for the operator up to a set amount. And the critical uh, conditions for inclusion, if you like, of the insurers was that we, we understood that the liability was limited in both time and amount. And there were some very uh, strict definitions of coverage and uh, jurisdiction. And this uh, situation really from the outset of the civil nuclear program right the way through to Chernobyl um, existed and worked extremely effectively. Obviously, uh, the uh, Chernobyl accident, I think, made people uh, realize that, uh, that the real true cross-border scope of a serious nuclear accident, and that, as Jimenez very uh, uh, helpfully outlined just now, demanded some further uh, revisions to the uh, liability arrangements. And so more, more money was made available and a wider scope. But these changes introduced some problems for the insurers. Originally, it was to do with quantification um, of our loss of understanding the environmental impact of these revised, uh, uh, these revised conventions, elements to do with the loss of income, and in particular, the 30 years, the introduction of a much longer time to bring a claim. And more recently, there's now been a bit more competition uh, in the nuclear world with both the industry setting up mutuals and um, some more pool insurers, so, so some no, non-pool insurers. So the markets open up a bit. Uh, next slide, please. So that today, where we are right now, is that although the conventions um, have been revised, and still, as Jimena said, the 2004 revised Paris Brussels regime is not implemented, most of the revisions have been accepted. Insurers have got much more comfortable with uh, the uh, environmental aspects and the um, other issues that they didn't like, except for one, which is this 30-year period to bring a claim. 
Now, why is that such a problem for us as an insurance market? Well, anything that introduces such a long-term prospect uh, inherently is judged as volatile. And it means that judging how much money you need to put aside for that is extremely difficult because in 29 years, you could have a claim or you may not have a claim. So that is critically a, a, a big issue for us. And obviously, there are other aspects about judicial inflation. That's the, the, inc the increase in claims over time. And the fact there's no real trigger. Any, any loss, any event is covered. And, and that leads to a great deal of uncertainty and has meant that the insurance market, um, the, although the overall amount of insurance is adequate, the full capacity for the full scope of cover is not available. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, what will happen? How will we resolve all this? Well, um, the revised uh, conventions, I think, are now likely to be uh, implemented uh, at the beginning of 2022. But there will probably still be an uninsured aspect to this 30 year cover. Excuse me, that's my time. The 30 year cover and that um, will probably be covered by the state or the operator where uh, insurance is not available. It's my opinion that in the longer run, the insurance market will cover the full scope eventually and will be able to offer even higher amounts. So I think uh, that there is some optimism that down the line it'll, it'll, it'll evolve and develop. The market will be able to cover these things, but it's just uh, getting there is, is a slow process. And I think the thing that will help all that is a significant number of new sources of insurance. There's a lot of innovation in the market in terms of new uh, sources of capital in particular to back it, and perhaps the development of trigger mechanisms that could um, really relate to defining the catastrophic element of a loss and allowing a lot more insurance to be available for large nuclear accidents, which um, would uh, then materially open up a lot more compensation from the private sector. And just really a few challenges ahead for, I think, for, for, for um, both the operators and for the uh, insurance markets is decommissioning. Obviously, there are big liabilities involved and, and certainly the, the conventions apply to the decommissioning risks, uh, but there's much more limited cash flow to pay for it. So from our perspective as insurance market participants, less money to pay premiums, which um, we do actually need. And um, of course, uh, new technology. So the, the development of the small model reactors that on the horizon is it ever getting any closer, but fusion and whether these are judged nuclear risks or not. And that will have a big impact as to whether they fall within the regime and then are required to have such complicated liability um, insurance arrangements, or maybe that perhaps the fusion, they fall outside it, which will make the provision of insurance to them a lot more simple. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. That's my Peace over. Well, thank you very much indeed too, Mark. Um, and so moving, moving on, um, all of this, the liability regimes, the issues uh, are around um, financial security and insurance coverage fit into the much, of course, much wider picture of international nuclear trade and in, in international commercial development. And um, I think, Will, you're probably gonna be picking up that particular point. Okay. Um, Many thanks, Paul, and it's, uh, it's really a privilege to talk with everyone on the video call. It's great to uh, talk with everyone on the video call and especially all of our uh, distinguished alumni who are joining us again. Though we are not in Montpellier this year, uh, it is special to have everyone together in this format. Today, we've been hearing about nuclear legal issues associated with governments and public international law. I'd like to take, uh, take the opportunity in this last part of our session to connect some of these legal issues to the private law side of the industry where public international law rubber meets the road, so to speak. First slide, please. Okay, companies and governments in the international nuclear industry are seeing development in new build programs across key regions particularly in Eurasia, in China, and Russia, with further growth in the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and the Americas. In addition, in Africa, the IAEA is supporting 37 countries in establishing regulatory bodies, and a number of those countries are also considering civil nuclear power. The drivers for nuclear energy in many of the countries remain the same, including the need for baseload generation with limited national energy resources. But we are also seeing efforts at decreasing carbon emissions to meet low carbon goals, which in turn competes with renewable energy sources. 
trending legal issues we are seeing are focused on powerful commercial tools to fund and de-risk projects through corporate structures, finance agreements, and construction contract terms, where efforts are being made to replicate the most successful models. There have been a number of different successful models that we've worked with over the years, and so it's fair to say that successful structures can differ from country to country. But we have found success in particular in providing cost certainty and a clear understanding between the parties regarding shared licensing, construction, and oversight risks. In the area of safety, partly because, as mentioned earlier, the Vienna Declaration on Nuclear Safety, and also just the natural diversification of suppliers and subsuppliers in some markets, we found a need for lawyers to help advise new build countries to provide advice regarding best in class regulations that combine best practices from different countries. And finally, we have seen an increasing number of legal questions regarding the area of export controls, in part because many of the applicable laws and concepts and that includes in the United States were drafted some years ago before the advent of the current, particularly international industry. Next slide, please. As uh, Paul Bowden referenced in his introductory remarks, we're seeing a number of initiatives today that indicate a bright future for nuclear power. The need to be able to provide safe, low carbon energy places nuclear power in a neat position among other generation sources. On the large plant side, generation four reactors can provide safety and reliability features that are a significant improvement over some of the older designs and they show promise if they can be built economically. In addition to Westinghouse's technology, China recently announced a plan to export its generation four plant, the CAP 1400, as an export product, for example. Additionally, we're seeing growth and competition among SMR and advanced reactors with over 60 designs in various stages of development. Some of these may provide a sea change in terms of safety and nonproliferation improvements. On the legal side, each of these require new regulatory analyses, as well as funding and contract models, as well as the ability to access HALU fuel and some of the designs. Interestingly, we also are seeing requests concerning so-called green hydrogen and nuclear, which can be used to fuel different transport systems. At Pillsbury Winthrop, for example, last week we opened a new practice group to help clients work through hydrogen issues. So it's a whole new area of, of interest and, and, uh, and requests. We're also excited about legal applications associated with the use of blockchain technologies to see if they can help improve IAEA safeguards, which has implications in the public international side. In the area of fusion, which is always the nuclear technology of the future, as we uh, joke, investors are working hard to understand investments in fusion technology and companies are working to understand how legal requirements apply to hybrid fusion fission systems and nascent fusion technologies like lattice confined fusion. And finally, but not least, we see opportunities in waste disposal markets as older fleets retire. On the legal side, we've seen private equity investors, which have often shied away from the civil nuclear sector, more heavily involved in understanding the legal risks and best practices associated with long and intermediate nuclear waste storage. All to say that there are great possibilities for the peaceful and safe use of nuclear technologies and opportunities in the law to help further the industry. And I'd like to turn it over to Paul for a session discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Will. Um, if we could all gather, gather back together again, um, that would be great because we've, we've, had, um, we've had two great questions in which uh, it would be fantastic get, to get the views from our panelists on. And the, the first one we've got is, is this, um, nuclear, so the questioner says, nuclear liability and insurance regimes as we know them are creatures of the 1950s. They were created in effect by the arrival of new technologies and they brought new sorts of human risks. Are these regimes still suitable today as technologies change again? Um, advanced reactors, SMRs, all the things we've been hearing about. And with them, the risks are changing, arguably reducing to something quite different. What do the panelists think about this? Um, 
Mark, can I can I ask you to <clears throat> have a first go at that question? Absolutely, Paul. Yeah, um, I think uh, <clears throat> the regimes will remain suitable for this sort of thing for as long as society considers that the risk from a nuclear, nuclear installation warrants a special liability regime. I mean, ultimately, as Khamenei said, if we have uh, the possibility of a, a very large scale accident, then the regimes will probably remain in place. From an insurance perspective, utopia would be for an operator if their nuclear assets were treated in exactly the same way as their non-nuclear assets in terms of the risk, so they wouldn't need a regime. But to achieve this, we've got to have a reduction in the risk posed, so that's no catastrophic risk possibility, and a big shift in public perception. So as um, Will said at the end of his, maybe our quest for um, uh, worries about the globe and the planet and all that kind of thing, and our quest for low carbon, maybe uh, we'll get over that and be much more permissive and open about nuclear and, and allow uh, a different or more less uh, rigid regime exist. Yeah, can I perhaps turn to you next on this one, Will? I mean, just if you could just take the role of the insured for the moment. Um, and you've been speaking about these technologies um, that are appearing in the question. What's, what's, what's your view about the changes in technology, the changing risks, uh, and whether or not we've got a, a current global regime or regimes uh, that are fit for purpose? Well, I guess what I'd say is, is that as we see more countries entering into the international nuclear space, new build countries in new locations in continents of Africa or other places in Asia where the standard international nuclear liability system doesn't really have a strong uh, toehold, um, it becomes really important not just for the country that's considering the nuclear, but also its neighboring countries to be a part. And so um, I think that there is a kind of a great story to tell in terms of uh, the importance of the international nuclear liability regime, and it's going to become more important uh, in the next decade or two uh, than it has maybe at any other time. Yeah, I think. And Jimena, from your perspective, from the point of view of the nuclear liability lawyer. Well, I think uh, nuclear liability is always a, a, a major concern. With regards to the new technologies, I mean, everything uh, will, will be covered with regards to the, the, the new technologies that we're going to have, for example. I mean, for me, it's one of the topics that most people are asking me, you know, it's, it's uh, how is nuclear liability going to cover uh, the new technologies? And uh, so I would like to say that, well, it does cover because nuclear installations has a a wide definition. However, there might be questions with regard to the floating nuclear power plants, uh, for which when they're fixed, you can consider them as nuclear installations, but then we have to continue discussing uh, about after that, so how, how it goes. But otherwise, I mean, nuclear liability is an evolving uh, field that adapts to oncoming situations. Uh, thanks, Amina. That, there's, there's another question, which I think is probably particularly directed to you, actually, but I might ask Mark first for his perspective uh, and, and, and then to come to you on it. And, and this question is, uh, the questioner says, I was very interested uh, to hear Jimena on uh, the Convention on Supplementary Compensation. Uh, also, to listen to Mr. Magwood's views on the harmonization of nuclear power plant licensing regimes. Uh, I heard him say that it may not be possible. I think that means harmonization, and it may not be a good thing. In the area of nuclear liability, has harmonization really happened? And even if it has, is it a good thing? Mark? Well, in the interest of time, I can give you my straight answer, which I think is no, it hasn't happened, but I think it would be a good thing if it did. Um, <laughs> but I think, yeah, without spend too much time with we could have a long discussion on this i better give the floor to somebody else before i get carried great, away great response he may know uh i must say that my answer will be a little bit different uh, it depends on what you mean by harmonization for me there is harmonization because all the conventions provide for the same nuclear liability principles so in a certain sense the states that have uh, ratified to them there i mean th there is a harmonization there now, it's true that for the insurers, and I can understand that the fact that countries have different liability amounts must be a headache, because then uh, it's true that for transport issues, for example, it's extremely difficult, because there is no harmonization with regard to the amounts. Each country uh, can set up uh, the amounts they want. Uh, afterwards, uh, well, there is a big question about the international global, sorry, international global nuclear liability regime. Does it exist? What is it? I mean, is that harmonization also in a certain sense? 
And I must say that I don't see that really coming soon. The important thing for all the countries is to be able to have most treaty relations with each other because that will also help uh, for Will's part, uh, let's say trade, construction, uh, and also the insurance. Uh, so the important thing, in order to have the most treaty relations with everybody, uh, there have been three countries that have done that. Uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Ghana, uh, Romania, they, they are in fact parties to the revised Vienna Convention, to the CSC, and well, I didn't mention that instrument, but to the joint protocol. The joint protocol is in fact a bridge between the Paris and the Vienna Convention that links them. So by adhering to these three instruments, then you have to do relations with everybody. So that's maybe another way of talking about harmonization. Well, thank you very much, Jimena. Um, and, and thank you all for that, for that session. Um, and it, well, it brings us to sort of wrap up time, really. Um, and I'm, I'm going to kick off the wrap up and I think you'll probably finish it, Jimena. And um, I think what I'll do is, is run through what, what, what have really quickly, what have just struck me as the key points that have been coming out of, out of the conversations and the presentations we've had today, uh, key points as to what we're probably going to be looking at as nuclear lawyers as key issues over the next year, five years, next 10 years, and probably we'll still be discussing uh, and debating at Montpellier in, in, in 2030. Uh, and, and my list is first, around, first of all around how the current safety regimes are actually going to work out in terms of addressing the questions around uh, plants, nuclear power plants, which have got lifetime uh, extensions, uh, an issue touched on both by, by Steve and obviously by, uh, by, by Kimberly. Um, uh, connected with that, a second point, uh, Steve's point is, um, are we likely or unlikely uh, to see any major new instruments uh, in, the, in, in the area of nuclear safety? Uh, are we more likely to see um, steps being taken and safety secured by way of greater collaboration uh, between regulators and harmonization of, of regulatory regimes. Um, third point I picked up from Wolfram was the move from uh, confidentiality to transparency in the way in which the international community is dealing with issues uh, around the safety of uh, nuclear installations and, and, and nuclear facilities. Another point, uh, sort of my point really, is as it were the sort of legal weaponization of environmental protection and human rights in relation to uh, licensing processes and procedures uh, for new nuclear power developments. Um, clearly um, issues around international harmonization uh, of license processes themselves, um, all facing sort of challenges that, that arise from the new technologies that we're seeing introduced in, in ways that uh, DG Magwood and um, and Will spoke about. Um, we touched a little on nuclear safety culture, which clearly is still embryonic and in a process of an important process of development. Um, how is the MPT regime going to evolve? Um, um, those issues are dealt with by, by Laura and, uh, and, 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 and Christian. Um, and then from our last session, um, the key point that hit me was, um, what is the small print going to look like in the new insurance policies, which are going to be underwritten uh, for those seeking cover uh, post um, the coming into force of the 2004 protocol? Oh, yeah. And, and I suppose my last question is, um, uh, uh, after COVID, will Christian de Francia be allowed to keep the Gulfstream jet, which has been leased for him by the IEA? Um, but it doesn't really matter uh, what I think about any of this. What really matters is what you all think. And so um, I'd like to finish with, with a poll of, of all of us, uh, if we could, could organise that, um, Kimberly, uh, Patricia. And, and the poll is really intended to um, get some views on what you think we as nuclear lawyers are all going to be focusing on and thinking about and writing about and debating with each other over the next five to 10 years. And as I said, what are we gonna be talking about uh, at ISNL in Montpellier in 2030? So we've given you a bit of a pick list here. It's quite a long pick list. You can only pick one, so you'll need to read quickly. 
Uh, and please don't think too hard about this. Just go for the topic uh, that immediately strikes you. So if we could give ourselves a couple of minutes and if we could start to vote on this, what do we think will be the key topics of international nuclear law over the next five to 10 years? What have we got? Long term, blah, 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 running right through. We have, it looks like if I've got to the right one, um, yes, 29% think advanced nuclear power reactors, including SMRs, are going to be the hottest of topics over the next few ensuing years. Um, I thank you very much for participating in our little poll. I thank you for myself anyway, for joining us all. Uh, my thanks to all our panelists, uh, to Kimberly, Patricia, and all who've organized this. And I pass over now to Jimena. Thank you very much, Paul. But I think that before we, um, I close this webinar, I think Kimberly has some information to provide uh, on OLC educational programs. Kimberly, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Naman. I appreciate that. And thank you, Paul, for your wonderful wrap up as always. Now, I have just a few minutes with you to provide a bit of information. We've obviously been talking so much about the ISML in the background, and we've had a lot of really great questions come in during the course of this webinar together with people asking for more information. So we can just get the first slide up. So we are we're so lucky and thankful that um, both of our education programs, our International School of Nuclear Law and our International Nuclear Law Essentials are conducted under Paul Bowden's leadership, which we are genuinely grateful for. Um, so the International School of Nuclear Law, the 2021 summer session dates are the 23rd of August to the 3rd of September. The applications for the program will open in January and we will be posting these on the NEA's website. Our applications will be accepted through the 31st of March. If you'd like to be placed on the list to receive more information about the program when it is announced, please email us at the ISNL email address that we're providing in the chat. We're also, we provided the, um, the hyperlink to the ISNL website also in the chat now and we've provided it in the past in the beginning of the program as well. Next slide. Now, if you need additional details about the program, we have what we call the ISML commemorative brochure. And we have a lot of really great information here about the academics, participants, the social program, community, and as we like to call it, the spirit of Montpellier. Again, the link to that can be found in the chat. Next slide. There's also another program that we haven't referred to yet during this webinar, and it's called the International Nuclear Law Essentials. This program has been running since 2011. And it's actually a five-day program. This course is an intensive program that focuses on, on the practical elements of the legal issues relating to the safe and peaceful use of nuclear energy. The program is open to applicants with at least one year of relevant professional experience and a basic understanding of law as it relates to nuclear energy. Now, the INLE is usually held in February in Paris. We have not yet made any announcements about the 2021 session, but given the current health situation, it is most likely that we will not be able to hold it in the traditional in-person format, which is a, a great shame for us because we so enjoy getting people together. It's really that community element that we like to create in our programs that at least personally, I think makes them so special. So stay tuned for more information on the, um, the format for INLE in 2021. You can keep up to date with that at the website shown on your screen and in the chat. And again, if you'd like to be placed on an email announcement list, or when we do um, explain what we're going to do going forward. Again, just send us a note to the email address that you have on the screen. Next slide. And lastly, for all of the alumni who are participating in this webinar, um, we have two directories, if you're not aware, that we like to use to help our past participants as well as our lecturers maintain the connections that they established during the course of the ISNL or INLE, as well as to build connections across the years. Access to these directories is password restricted and available only to those alumni and lecturers who are listed. Please email us if you'd like to update your contact information in the directory or if you're an alumnus or lecturer and wish to be included in the directory. In addition, we have two closed ISNL and INLE alumni groups on LinkedIn that you can request to join. And with that, I'll kick it back over to Jimena. Thank you all so much for your participation. It's been a pleasure having you with us. 
indeed. I mean, I have to thank very much for all our panelists. I hope that we provided you with the latest developments in all their fields. And also thank you to you all very much for listening to all who listen in. We appreciate your very active participation, especially in the polls. For the 10th anniversary of the SNL, the NEA published a compendium of articles written by the lecturers of that time to cover all the areas addressed in the curriculum. Even though time has passed, and some conventions have entered into force since then, such articles remain relevant and you can go through them if you would like to have more information about what we discussed today. However, please note that we're currently updating that publication and that a 20th anniversary compendium will be published next year. But meanwhile, just go and have a look to this 10th anniversary one. The webinar has been recorded and will be put up on YouTube in the coming days. You can follow the NEA and the SNL on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook to keep in touch with us and receive updates on our programs and events. We hope to see you all again in the near future and hopefully in person, whether at our INLE, ISNL or any of our OLC future events. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.